Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Steve Levin. I'm council uh, chair of the Council of General Welfare Committee. I'm joined here today by council members Barry Grudenchik and Bob Holden of Queens. Uh, today we will be hearing, today's hearing will be addressing the issue of food access, quality, and safety at our Department of Homeless Services shelters. Every single New Yorker, regardless of their housing status or level of income, deserves safe and nutritious food. It is imperative to this committee that individuals and families in shelter have access to quality food, not only because it is the humane thing to do, but also because diet is a critical part of health and overall wellness. As we all well know, housing status is very much a public health issue. Those experiencing homelessness are more likely to have medical needs and health issues than their securely housed counterparts, more, more likely to have medical needs and health issues than their securely housed counterparts. Poor and inadequate diet can exacerbate or even cause some of these health issues and conditions that disproportionately affect those experiencing homelessness. Housing insecurity is incredibly stressful and the experience of homelessness is fraught with hardship and difficult challenges. Accessing food, a good and nutritious food should not be one of those. During 2017, over 18 million meals were served in New York City's homeless shelters. There are 100 shelters overseen by DHS that have food catered or prepared on site. While food served by city agencies must meet certain requirements regarding nutrition per the food standards set by the city, we know through the state controller's audit last year, talking to those in shelter, and news reports that these meals are often inadequate for individuals and families served. The recent news reporting that six people became violently ill after eating food suspected to be spoiled at the Auburn family residence in Fort Greene, and many reported incidents before it, underscores the need for the city to ensure that food served is safe and healthy. Barriers to healthy and adequate food remain for those in the shelter system. Most of those individuals and families in shelter cannot assemble or prepare meals for themselves with these settings lacking the proper space and resources to do so. With lengths of stay averaging well over a year in shelter, the in this inability to make such basic decisions as to what you will feed yourself and your family must take a toll. At a bare minimum, we need to ensure that the, the food provided to residents is safe, healthy, and accommodates any dietary restrictions. Today, the committee will examine DHS and DOHMH food quality and safety standards. The inspection process for both agencies and the quality assurance measures put into place to ensure access to nutritious food at city-operated and provider-run shelters. I want to thank the members of the administration and the advocates who are here today for joining us, and I look forward to hearing from all of you on these critical issues. Um, you know, just on a, on a personal note, when I was uh, telling my two-and-a-half-year-old daughter this morning what I was going to be doing at work today, um, I struggled to explain to her what this hearing would be about because I didn't want her, it was hard to explain why some, some children don't have a kitchen, why some children don't have access to a home cooked meal, um, why some children don't have a home. And um, I, I, I decided to, to, not, to not burden her with that this morning um, because um, I knew that it would concern her because um, no child should be um, without the ability to have, you know, a home cooked bowl of oatmeal in the morning or a home cooked dinner at night. And uh, until, until we are ensuring that every child is able to have that, that's in our sh city shelter system, um, then we still have a lot more work to do. So um, I want to thank my colleagues that are here, again, Councilmember Grudentrick and Holden, and I want to also thank staff for preparing today's hearing. I'm going to kill on Senior Counsel, Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst, Natalie Omery, the po Policy Analyst, and Frank Sarno, Finance Analyst, 
as well as Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff, and Elizabeth Adams, my legislative director. And with that, um, I will turn it over to members of the administration for testimony. Uh, we are joined by Dr. Fabienne Larocque, the um, health director at New York City Department of Homeless Services, and Corinne Schiff, uh, New York City Department of Health and Mental Health. And I will ask committee counsel to swear you in. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Levin and members of the General Welfare Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and speak on the important work to transform the haphazard shelter system that built up over many decades, and in particular, on food access, quality, and inspection at DHS shelters. My name is Dr. Fabienne Larac, and I am the Medical Director for the New York City Department of Homeless Services. My colleague, the Administrative Nutritionist, uh, Ms. Diana Salerno, should have uh, joined us. She's directly responsible for uh, food um, services. However, she's currently um, nine months pregnant and uh, in the hospital. <laughs> And uh, I'm also joined by uh, Corinne Chief, Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. As you know, in 2017, Mayor de Blasio announced turning the tide on homelessness in New York City, a plan that places community and people first in addressing homelessness. Given homeless New Yorkers who come from every community across the five boroughs, the opportunity to be sheltered in their home borough as close as possible to their support networks, anchors of life, including schools, job, healthcare, family, houses of worships, and community they call home, in order to more quickly stabilize their lives. This will be achieved by ending the use of 360 cluster shelters in commercial hotel locations, while opening 90 borough-based shelters in all five boroughs, which will shrink the Department of Homeless Services footprints by 45% and allow us to implement a more equitable system that takes into account the individual needs of the children and adults we, sh we shelter. And we continue to make good on this promise. Just earlier this week, we announced the planned conversion of 14 cluster buildings used to house homeless families into over 200 affordable permanent housing units. As far as uh, the Office of the Medical Directors, our effort to transform the past approach to providing shelters has included an investment in how DHS delivers and ensures health care for those seeking or residing in shelter. One of those investments was adding appropriately licensed and experienced clinical staff to the office I manage, the Office of the Medical Director. This additional staff allowed DHS to better respond to those in shelter with medical and behavioral needs and to design plan, and oversee such services. The Office of the Medical Director has oversight with regard to medical, health, and mental health standards and related consultations need of the DHS system. My office, comprised of an integrated and complementary high-skill team, has implemented a successful overdose prevention program, is working with DOHMH and DHS programs team to provide hepatitis A vaccination to street homeless clients and clients residing in mental health and substance use shelters, is developing tools and mechanisms for increasing access to care, and is improving the quality of food and medical services. Lastly, work to develop standard guidelines and procedures in collaboration with DHS facility and logistic division and program division, which respectively conduct overall shelter inspections and have oversights on all aspects of shelter operations and shelter's compliance with standards. Foodborne illness, obesity, heart disease are conditions that are impacted by the food a, a person consumes, and particularly for foodborne illness, a serious health concern, we take strong measures to ensure shelter meets the state sanitary code, federal guidelines, and the New York City Health Code and the New York City Food Standards. The health and safety of our clients are of the utmost importance. For this reason, we invest in providing guidance, training, developing tools, providing technical assistance for proper food service in shelters. All shelter employees responsible for receiving, storing, preparing, and or distributing meals to DHS clients must follow guidelines set forth by the agency based on the New York City Health Code, Article 81, and federal and state guidelines. For instance, Shelter employees must be trained on food safety, free of communicable diseases transmittable by food, water, hands, or air, 
and compliant with work requirements, such as wearing hair restraint and gloves when serving food and practicing good hand hygiene. Sites that prepare, store, heat, and or distribute meals to DHS clients are required to obtain a food service establishment permit from the health department and comply with the city health code and the food and nutrition standards. Sites are annually inspected by the health department and must communicate the inspection result to DHS. As with all food service establishment in New York City, the DHS site must have a certified New York City food handler who has received food protection training present at all hours of the food service operation and when receiving meals and food ingredients. DHS is regularly monitoring the status of shelters permits as their annual permit, there is constant surveillance of permit status across the DHS system to ensure the sites are abiding by the DOHMH permit requirement. Along with regular food service inspection completed by DOHMH, DHS, as part of the routine site review inspection, which is our primary tool to inspect and assess the physical plant condition of our shelters to ensure they are in compliance with codes, regulations, and laws, also conduct semi-annual food service inspections at all DHS directly run and contracted shelters. If necessary, a corrective action plan must be submitted to DHS within 14 business days. Shelters are required to develop and implement procedures to ensure meals meet the food safety standard outlined in local, state, and federal uh, food sanitation code, and to conduct regularly, regular food safety quality tests to maintain high food uh, safety standards. An important point to underscore is that when food is delivered, good food safety management is essential. Shelter must ensure that all food ingredients and meal received are not expired, are properly labeled, are of acceptable temperature and quality, and are subsequently stored according to sanitary standards. To assist shelters in their effort to ensure food safety and abide by food sanitation codes, DHS has issued a procedure bulletin that outlines all the food safety points that I have mentioned, and well, as well as other important areas to prevent foodborne illness, such as proper heating, reheating, and cooling of meals, monitoring of served food, refrigerator, and freezer temperatures, proper washing of cooking and serving utensils, and sanitizing of dishes and food contact surfaces. To support shelters in their effort to comply with food safety standards, we develop training tools and guidance documents, offer corrective action plans, and are developing a webinar which shelter staff will have to review annually to keep up with their training on food safety. In addition, the DHS nutritionists provide regular technical assistance to shelter staff to assist with implementation of food safety standards. In terms of nutrition, Obesity is a risk factor for many health conditions, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension. In New York City, obesity is epidemic. More than half of adult New Yorkers are overweight or obese. The rate of childhood obesity is rising. Nearly half of all elementary school children and Head Start children are not at a healthy weight. As the administration testified in the Council's food equity hearing in September, we are well aware of the concern of access to nutritious and healthy food for low-income New Yorkers. With our administration partners and sister agencies, we are committed to increasing this access. An example is the creation and implementation of the Plentiful app to increase food pantry usage and help clients reduce the amount of money spent on food. Moreover, scientific evidence indicates that health outcomes are directly tied to access to adequate nutritious food. New York City created the New York City Food Standards to reduce the prevalence of obesity-related health conditions by increasing access to healthy food and improving dietary intake. These standards set forth the amount of nutrients, including sodium, protein, fat, and sugar, and the type of foods to be used, for example, the use of whole grain products. Today, the standard applies to approximately 250 million meals and snacks per year that are served in places such as schools, senior centers, homeless shelters, child care centers, after school programs, correctional facilities, public hospitals, and parks. At DHS, we work closely with shelters to comply with the New York City food standards, which contain standards for purchased foods, as well as meals and snacks served. The food standards overarching goal is to help lower the risk of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease for New Yorkers served by city agency. 
a goal carried out by increasing the amount of fiber and decreasing the amount of fat, sodium, and sugar in clients' diets. DHS's administrative nutritionist works with DHS sites to monitor compliance with the food standards, review meal menus and portions, and conduct or review nutrient analysis to ensure healthy nutrition standards are met, and provide technical assistance to staff on means to enhance nutrition and improve meal services. Annually, DHS collects food metrics data from shelters and sites to comply with the New York City food standards. And those are included in the mayor's food metric reports, also as well to identify area that need to be addressed to make sure clients are being served nutritious and healthy food. As part of our ongoing effort to improve the nutritional health of our client, three initiatives we are currently working on are to provide available interactive nutrition demonstration with healthy eating lessons to increase acceptance and consumption of fruits and vegetables, implement meatless Mondays at DHS-run shelters, and carry out an increase in the calorie intake standards for male clients in the shelter system to ensure clients receive sufficient calories for their daily living according to their needs. This particular change follows current federal dietary guidelines. Previously, the recommended calorie intake standard was 2,000 for both men and women. We recognize that some of our clients come from different backgrounds and have different needs. For clients who have medical conditions or dietary restrictions, such as requiring kosher or halal meals, DHS's reasonable accommodation re policy requires that their dietary needs are met. As you've heard, DHS is committed to working with our shelters to ensure that our clients receive nutritious and safe meals. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. LaRock. Um, I also want to acknowledge Councilmember Brad Lander has joined us. Um, so I'll start by asking, um, throughout the, the shelter system, there's different um, formats of shelter, correct? Yes, that's so, correct. Um, can you explain a little bit how food service works um, in the various iterations of shelter, whether it's a single adult shelter, um, city run, not-for-profit run, and then within family shelter, um, there are three um, uh, versions of family shelter, tier two, um, uh, hotels, and cluster sites. If you could kind of go through a little bit of how, uh, how, how New Yorkers in shelter are interacting with food. Certainly, thank you for your question. So for single adult shelters, those are all congregate setting where clients share a large room. In all of the single adult shelters, food is provided. They receive three meals a day plus snacks. Uh, the, they receive um, the same uh, basically type of food. Uh, sorry, they actually, uh, there they are different ways that the food is served. So some shelters res can cook on site and depending on the setting of the facility, some culture actually have a, f um, um, a full kitchen and they cook on site. Some shelters receive batch meals in, in large trays and proportion, and others receive uh, trays that are individual trays and uh, sealed. Um, they, uh, again, they are providing three meals a day, and the meals uh, follow the food standards and the food and safety codes. In terms of the family shelters, the tier two shelters have full apartments and kitchens, so the uh, family cook for themselves. In the hotel, because the, of the lack of kitchen, this is not possible, so they uh, receive meals. Um, uh, my understanding is that the cluster site also apartments so um, client cook for themselves. In terms of contracted and directly run, the directly run sites and a small number of contracted sites receive food from DHS directly held food contracts, um, whereas the rest of the providers have their own subcontractors and food caterer that, uh, um, that they can use. Um, regardless, they have to follow contracted rules, they have to follow the food standards, they all have to follow the sanitary code, their menus are reviewed by our dietitian, and if any menu is not compliant, there will be a corrective action uh, to bring the menus into compliance. Okay, um, so with regard in particular to um, hotels, um, you know, I'm very concerned about children that are residing in hotels. I imagine if there's 22,000 children in the shelter system, there's got to be seven, eight, nine thousand that are in hotels. 
Um, and the length of stay um, is, is, has continued to go up over time. And so the, the average length of stay is over 400 days now. Um, and I'm very concerned about um, those families' ability to um, just appropriately feed their children. Having a uh, microwavable, pre-cooked um, meal, three meals a day, um, for a year and a half uh, for a young child, I, I think that, that could be very um, you know, detrimental to their health, to their um, from a kind of psychological perspective, I think it would be impactful. Um, and it's, it, it's just the idea that you don't have, I mean, do they have refrigerators in hotels? I mean, they, they have a, maybe a small mini fridge probably, but. They can request a refrigerator, that's correct. Mini fridge, but, but not enough to keep a carton of milk necessary, or you know, you can maybe have a carton of milk, but you, you can't have a carton of milk and a carton of orange juice and leftovers and um, et cetera. Um, and what I'm concerned about is when families don't have, or you know, are, are grow, maybe grow uh, weary of the, um, the pre, you know, the, the microwavable food that is provided, may, um, may order out, may do takeout, food that's high in sodium, um, you know, it can, it can have, um, you know, a variety of impacts on both children and adults' health as it relates to high blood pressure, or diabetes, et cetera. Um, so what, what do we do about that? I mean, how are we, you know, and, and just, just to one other thing is that, you know, most of the hotels are actually run by just two providers. There's really just, you know, the big contracts, it's about $500 million between two providers um, to do hotels. And so, you know, a very large part of the system, and actually as cluster sites are being phased out, we are continuing to rely on hotels, and I think that that's probably going to be the case um, for the foreseeable future. So how are we approaching that issue strate strategically? Thank you for your concern. This is a very serious concern. The health of our client is critical to us, especially with children that are so vulnerable. Um, our heart definitely goes to the children, and um, that's why we want to phase out the hotels. Mm -hmm. So our plan is to phase out the hotel and build, as part of our 90 new shelters, enough family shelters for our families. Um, of course, this takes you know, a little time to um, get that transition. In the meantime, we work closely with the hotels to ensure that the food is safe and nutritious. Right, but how are we, so the contractors themselves are doing the, or the, the you know, the, the provider agencies are doing the contracting for the food. How are yes. we, what's, how are we inspecting their, um, I know that the, if, actually, if you could speak a little bit to the controller's report and the findings there, um, state controller from, from 2018, um, which noted that um, of the sites that they visited, um, only 59% only of the um, inspections, the relevant inspections had been done. Can you speak a little bit to that and, and when, how, the, um, how the recommendations are, are being implemented? Certainly, thank you for the question. Uh, we work very closely with the auditors from the controller's office and provided um, all the information uh, that we had. Um, note that uh, some of the years uh, that the controller's office uh, uh, reviewed were prior to this new um, set of uh, um, staff in the medical director's office. Uh, we agreed with most of the recommendations and we have put uh, um, corrective action in place and we are in compliance with the recommendations. As far as inspections are concerned, uh, our um, routine in inspections uh, review all the shelters twice a year. We are uh, in compliance and we have reviewed all the, inspected all the shelters twice, twice a year. If a deficiency is found, depending on the level of the deficiencies, uh, a corrective action will be requested and we will work closely with the providers to, um, uh, to improve. In addition, DOHMH conducts an inspection once a year. So on um, provider-run shelters, who, who has the responsibility on, um, 
on ensuring food safety? Is it the, is it the provider or is it the food vendor? It's all of us. So if they have a food vendors and they do not cook on site, then the food vendors has to meet all the federal, um, state, and city guidelines. Their food has to be nutritious. They has to be, uh, it has to be safe. It has to be transported and stored at the, uh, in the right conditions. Uh, the shelter uh, also, as uh, the moment they receive the food, they have responsibility for verifying that they are receiving the food that was ordered, that was expected, and that the food is at the right temperature, is not expired, there is no broken uh, labels. Then once they receive the food, they, are, um, they uh, store the food at the right temperature. Uh, their refrigerators uh, have to be uh, working. Uh, they have to check refrigerator's temperature. Uh, all the condition, they have to store um, the food according to guidelines. Um, and then on the DHS side, we inspect all the facilities we, uh, and we work to, uh, for corrective action. And DOHMH also inspect all of the facilities. Um, prior to January of 2018, um, before the routine site review inspection process uh, was incorporated, um, was were inspections done um, regularly, and who did those inspections then? There were two administrative contract staff that were um, that did the inspection in the in the administrative office. So they conducted in inspections. Were they were they trained in food safety? I believe matter? so. Um, but because we clearly we didn't think that was sufficient, that's why we now have 28 inspectors. And that's up from two inspectors prior. So there's realistically, it's um, unlikely that two inspectors would have been able to adequately inspect all of the shelters in New York City and all of the, just w uh, twice a year, it, it just seems um, unrealistic. Um, and so are we reading, reaching the targets that we're setting for ourselves now about um, twice a year inspections for each? Yes, facility? we are. Are there any exceptions to that? No. Um, is you, OTDA um, uh, notified when there are violations that are issued? Yes, OTDA, uh, we have an office of regulatory compliance that communicates with OTDA. Okay. And now, and wh where, when does uh, DOHMH inspection come into the process? Or is there, is there, a, is there are there separate inspections? Are there follow-up inspections that are done by DOHMH? So the, the health department has long inspected uh, homeless shelters that are providing food to their clients. Uh, our inspect, we inspect once a year and more frequently if we find issues that require follow-up. Okay. Um, and so that's a bare minimum of once a year in coordination with DH, uh, DHS or is it a totally separate process? These are separate processes. These are unannounced inspections and I, and I should say that the New York City Health Code uh, sets out require food safety requirements, and those apply um, to any type of food service establishment, whether it's a restaurant or a homeless shelter, and our inspection is the same. We're looking for uh, the same kinds of compliance with the very same rules. We are coordinating uh, very closely with DHS to communicate findings with them, and, and uh, since the audit uh, revealed, and, and, I, and you know that we agreed with some of those findings, um, revealed that there were providers that we that the health department was not aware of, um, and so even though we had long been doing inspections, there were ones that we did not that we were not aware of, um, and so we committed together to make sure that all those shelters um, came into compliance with permitting requirements and with and with so that we could do those inspections. And so we're now working closely to make sure that that information stays up to date. No, why wasn't DOHMH aware of those providers? They just hadn't filed for permits. That's right, and that can happen with any food service establishment. Mm -hmm. It happens you know, with, with restaurants as well. Someone can, can open for business, and, and it, we may not know that they exist, and so we have systems in place, and I think what we learned, um, all learned um, in that audit was that some of those systems had, had, had failed, and so we've now put them into place, and so we have a very routine uh, coordination now to make sure that our information stays 
current so that providers know that they need to uh, get a permit from us um, and, we, and DHS lets us know when those providers come online so we can work with the shelter to make sure that they come into permitting process and, then, and, th and that they're then inspected. And that was just a communication or coordination issue between DHS and, and DOHMH that they were not informing DOHMH of the when uh, I think that the, the, the information wasn't kept current. And, and, and as you know, I clearly reviewed the audit, um, and, and as obviously did we, and uh, that was something that was revealed, and so we have we've essentially fixed that mm -hmm. um, and have a really good uh, close coordination now, and so I think that our information stays very much up to date. Um, before I turn it over to my colleagues, I, I did want to ask about the incident at Auburn and whether there's been any clarity as to how that happened. I, I've, I've read conflicting um, press accounts of, of, of what happened there. Um, I mean, the first question is, um, you know, were in fact uh, these individuals um, food poisoned? Second question is, um, have we determined who um, uh, tampered with with the expiration dates and and uh, or what happened there and uh, and what the action is going to be taken, being that this is a city-run shelter and not a not a not-for-profit shelter. Thank you for these questions. On behalf of DHS, my heart goes with all of those that went to the hospital. Due to pending litigation, we cannot comment on the particulars of the issue at the time. But what I can say is that DOHMH testing from the incident showed that the food was negative for bacterial pathogens. And we provide and we, we will continue to provide nutrition safe food to our shelters. Um, and there's nothing more that you could say due to the litigation? That is correct. Um, OK, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues for questions. Uh, Councilmember Lander first. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for convening this he hearing, and thank you both for being here. And, and I'll start by, con this is obviously a really critically important topic, and, and I'll confess it's one that I have not focused on enough myself, even though I have both shelters and hotels in my district serving families and kids. So I want to push us to do better, but I don't want to do it like self-righteously. I appreciate that this is something that we all need to give more attention to than we've been, than we've been giving. And I guess I want to start with a question of like, um, you know, I understand especially responding to the state controller's report and the health code, why it's easy to think of this as we've got standards that we must make sure we live up to, but it, it strikes me there's an opportunity here to treat it a little differently than just like there's some minimum standards that we must be held accountable to. We've got our most vulnerable kids and families, and here's an opportunity to provide them with like nutrition and a way of thinking about and relating to food and getting ready for themselves to so, it, it, but it doesn't sound to me like we are, we have that at all. I mean, if what we're doing, especially for folks in hotels, is just like some vendor delivers minimally adequate meals and once a year we inspect and make sure they're not subpar. Um, and then I want to ask a few more questions about the shelters where I'm guessing there's a couple that probably have some models for doing this well. But is there a, is there a plan within DHS to say, like not, nutrition is not just like minimal compliance with state health guidelines, but uh, an opportunity to do right by our most vulnerable children and, and families. And if so, where is it? Thank you very much for your question. This is obviously a very important question. And as public health specialists, we take at heart the health of our children. DHS hired, uh, for example, myself as a public health specialist, but also an administrative nutritionist who has long experience in providing uh, uh, food to a vulnerable population. What our administrative uh, nutritionist did when she started at the end, um, end of 2016, she um, surveyed, so, so there's a plan. She surveyed all the shelters, she spoke to all the directors, she catalogs uh, what type of food uh, is served, what is happening in the shelter. So on the one hand, we are going to, um, we are making sure that the standards are, are um, applied, so that's one part of what we do. Um, she created, uh, we DHS created a, a whole comprehensive uh, series of food standards and food policy. We provide technical assistance, we develop tools uh, for, um, and to work with shelters and providers. On the other hand, yes, we have creative ideas, we want to improve nutrition, 
So our nutritionist conducted two food surveys, one in the adult uh, shelter system and one in the family. One of the things that we like to do is really hear from our clients. How can we develop uh, our programs if we don't hear from them? So we've gotten into the habit of having focus groups, interviews, surveys with our client to hear from them. So she, uh, we are using the recommendation from both surveys to make changes. Uh, our nutritionists also collaborate with other city agencies, the Department of Health, the Office of Food Policy, even DIFTA. She regularly speaks to other agencies and reviews the literature and is up to date. And so we want to do food demonstration for our clients. We want to promote uh, the use of the Plentiful app. Plentiful is an app that was developed by the Food Collaborative that HRE participated in, and with that app, you can actually better access food pantries and reserve food in advance and not have to, to, to have a line. So we, I, we I downloaded it when I was at Masbia maybe two or three weeks ago. They use it, and, and it is, a, it is a, a good, that's a good system. So the, the surveys you mentioned and the plan you mentioned, have those been made public or shared with the council? No. We haven't. The surveys are still internal. Um, we are would, still would, finalizing uh, the report and, uh, and presentation in terms of sharing it. I'm going to have to defer to the administration in our intergovernmental affair about that. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to ask for the record. Will you please provide them to the council? Yes. Okay. And I mean, I guess you can follow up with the chair and our council as to what, as to what deadline. I, you know, the kind of things that you won't surprise you that often come out of these hearings are like a bill requiring you to develop a plan. And so if you already have the plan and the surveys and you want to share them with us so we don't need to do it by law, that would be great. And I'm eager to see what, what things, you know, and look, I'm sure people said, because we've seen the pictures of the food and evidence from the controller's report that people said the food stinks. So I understand why the survey is not going to be like the food is great. So, but let's and I think will that be broken down by who was in a hotel, who was in a shelter where the nonprofit themselves provided the food, and who was in a shelter where a contractor provided the food? Yes, it is also broken down. Yeah, with the type of food, whether they are batch meals, cook on site, or um, trays, and not unsurprisingly, the the cook on the meal that are cook on site are, are preferred. Um, but the results are not as bad as you might think. Okay, well then, all the more reason to provide them to us soon. Um, can you just give us a breakdown of those categories you said here? I mean, the, the chair asked some of these questions, but I think it will be helpful for us to understand. In the hotels, it sounds like from the chair, there's two contracts. So can you just, like, for the hotels and the shelters, can you just give us a breakdown of um, yeah, like who has the country, you know, how big are the contracts and what shelters are doing cooking on site and what shelters are contracting for their food? Um, we can certainly provide you this information. I don't have all the details from the top of my head. We know that there is a number of shelters that, that cook on site and that receive batch meals. Uh, we know who the vendors are, and we can provide you that categorization. So, so that'll be good. I, again, respectfully, like that's the kind of data was reasonable to maybe bring to this hearing since this hearing is about exactly that topic. So I, I wish you had it today, but if you will provide it and follow up, that would be that would be great. And then we'll look uh, we'll look forward to getting the kind of results that break down um, what the feedback and responses were. Go ahead, sorry. Um, I'm listening. And is there any difference in inspection regime? either from DHS or from DOHMH or other partners, depending on um, what the, you know, whether, the, whether it's delivered by contract in a hotel or whether it's, uh, it sounds to me like there's more reason to be concerned about whether the hotel food, the food that, that our families that are in hotels are getting is, is, is more likely to be not living up to the standards than the ones in the shelters? So are we providing any extra scrutiny in places where there's reason to be more concerned, or is it just the kind of once a year across the board? So as far as the inspections are concerned, uh, we do it twice a year. It's the same inspection across the board. We have a standard tool that is uh, quite detailed that we review. But in terms of the, uh, we also do a separate um, we also review the nutrition standards. So there's the food safety that is 
uh, subject to the inspection, and then there is the, the nutrient content. So every shelter uh, that provides food has to report their nutrient analysis. The uh, nutritionist compiles this information, look at it very, very, very carefully, and if there is any deficiency identified, we, uh, she will work with the, uh, with the shelter to make sure that the food meets the standards. Uh, this report is compiled and sent to uh, the Department of Health, the Mayor's Office of Food Policy for their uh, annual report. And um, I can actually report that we are 93% compliant, which is the same as the city average. Um, and for the places where, and I guess again, without the data, it's a little hard to know, but it sounds like for the hotels, we've got a couple of large providers, and, and maybe for the shelters that are contracting, there's also a couple of large providers that, I mean, on the one hand, you could go on site and inspect the shelter and see the food, but on the other hand, if we have a couple of vendors providing large scale amounts, then there's opportunities to sort of focus on them. You could go upstream, you could look at the places they're making it and delivering it and give feedback and push for better kind of upstream rather than by the time it arrives at the shelter. What's the relationship with the large, with the large providers? Certainly, um, we, our nutritionist works with the vendors um, as needed, and if they are, uh, you know, the food caterer, she's in inspected and visited, not really inspected, but she's visited the food caterers and she works um, closely with them. Uh, the large food caterers, though, are, they have to meet uh, federal standards, state standards, uh, and uh, the New York City uh, food code. So we are quite confident that our food is safe and nutritious. Okay, but Okay, uh, do you believe that the fed minimum federal standards, state standards, and New York City food codes as a nutrition, and I, look, I, I wanna, I don't doubt that what you want is like a really robust, healthy families, but I know the way that we contract often produces the least common denominator, like that's how the world works. So I don't know who wrote the contract, I might get to that in a minute, but are those standards, do you believe that those standards are what you would want for the families in our homeless shelter system? So the food standards are based on, on evidence, on, on health evidence. Their goal is to reduce the incidence of cardiovascular diseases and obesity. And uh, obesity is a, is a problem in, for both adults and children. Uh, we see um, children developing uh, adult onset diabetes you know, as children. So the food standards, uh, uh, the aim of the food standards is really set the proper nutrition uh, proportion in terms of salt and fat and sugar. Um, I understand that when uh, clients are served food, the, the, the choice is removed in, in terms of uh, what they can uh, eat. But the, the goal of the food standard is not to, you know, restrict and, and meet minimum standard. It's really what all of us should follow. We should all follow the food standard. That, that's, that's the healthy way to eat. Have you or the administrative nutritionist given input or feedback for what should be in those contracts? Uh, the contract, yes, yes, absolutely. We, uh, uh, for, the, for the directly run contract, the, the new RFP was uh, written uh, closely in collaboration with the administrative contract and, um, and our nutritionist. The nutritionist reviews every menu. She needs to get them every time. She needs to get them when they are changed. She will take, so every four weeks, so the, they, they provide menu in four week cycles that get repeated. Um, four week cycles, three meals a day, that's dozens and dozens of meals. Every meal have different ingredients. So she looks at every single ingredient, every single meal, the food content, the, uh, and she does a nutrition analysis. Uh, so the, the menu are really scrutinized. We also um, hear complaints. If, uh, uh, say, a facility is receiving cheese sandwich every other day, uh, we hear that, or she will identify such a, it's not a deficiency per se, but you know, not necessarily the best, and she will um, suggest substitution in the menu um, for more variety and, and diversity. Okay. And um, does that then result for particular um, contractors or vendors in some sort of, you know, uh, report card scoring system, if there are vendors to whom you're having to say more often this is a problem, is there some evaluation system 
by which the vendors and providers are, are scored, evaluated, monitored, improved? Um, they, so for the, we, the nutrition report, we um, communicate with them when they are not compliant. In terms of having a standard uh, scoring, DHS started uh, shelter report cards. The food um, and nutrition portion is not yet on it, but this is uh, the effort of this new administration is to really increase compliance, raising the bar. Um, so we are really working hard to raise the bar. So that is something that definitely I can take back to the agency in terms of. Just so I understand, are you saying there there is a plan to add a food element, or you're saying that might be a good idea that you go will consider? That's a good idea. We'll bring it back okay, to the agency. Okay, great, very good. Thank you. Um, and then I guess my last question, and then I'll, I appreciate the time, and I'll, I'll yield back. Um, I'm guessing that our best providers, and I know some, you know, some of them I've been in, you know, the Kensington Family Shelter has a wonderful kitchen, you know, and I know they do uh, education and training programs. Do you have either as sort of like best practice models or as obligation um, some uh, guidance that for shelters to do um, education and training programs that are helping people develop good, healthy eating and, and cooking practices? Thank you for the questions. We, this is definitely something that, that we want to do. That is kind of the fun part of the job, if I may say, <laughs> uh, as public health specialists. So that's something that's in our plan. Uh, we have, uh, for example, a, a VISTA fellow that is working with a nutritionist, and we are, the, the, it's, it's our plan to develop tools and, it, and promote uh, education and uh, uh, help shelters be in contact with community organizations that can provide this type of education. And I, you know, my hunch, you know, from having seen a couple of it, is that if you, you know, sort of source from some of them, some of them are already doing this, and it might be possible to just take best practices that are already existing and try to spread them. Exactly. In fact, we had a demonstration uh, not long ago um, of um, healthy three bean salad, or uh, and it was really well received. I mean, healthy food can be good. Uh, and um, uh, I can attest to that. Yeah. And uh, so the demonstration was well received, yes. And, and I'll just end with this as a statement, not as a, as a question, so I, I don't take any more time. But on school food, you know, I think if you had looked at school food 10 or 15 years ago, you would have said uniformly, we are not doing all that well at providing healthy, nutritious, appealing food to kids. And but broadly, you know, we, and we made some progress. A lot of that progress was led in places where parents have more time, have more money, we're able to lean in, raise some dollars, bring in wellness in the schools. Um, and then people rightly asked equity questions, and so some of those practices have now been spread across the whole system, although we still have a ways to go. Obviously, that's a little less the case in our shelter system where you don't have like lovely PTAs raising money at fundraisers to say, can we bring in a not-for-profit that can up our food game? But it just strikes me that, you know, especially this week of having read Eliza Shapiro's story and it being Thanksgiving and kind of hearing this, that well, we should just all push ourselves to be the PTA um, that wants to make sure that homeless families in our system, like, not only don't have food that doesn't meet standards, but actually have food that we would want to feed our own kids. So let's, let's keep working hard to do better. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Heather Merlander. Um, just wanted to follow up on a little bit more around um, hotels, and then I'll, I'll call on Councilmember Holden. Um, what is the um, because there's sorry starting off because there's really two main providers uh, that do hotels. Um, are there are there um, just who hires the catering companies? They're 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 the ones that hire the catering companies. Is that right? I believe so. Okay, um, and it's just then a single catering company with the contract for, for uh, either of those. So there's two catering companies that are feeding probably 35% of the children in shelter. I will have to get back to you in terms of the, whether they use one or two caterers. But when the hotel starting started to um, provide the food, our nutritionists actually worked very closely for program staff and provided training to the hotels. Okay. Um, what is the, what's the per diem per meal? How much, are, are the per diem per, per um, 
per day. person? Um, I think it's eight. I think it might be seven or eight, eight dollars and thirty-nine $8. cents. I believe. I believe, but I we can get back to you with the exact amount. Yes, I think okay. that's around that. No, that's per day. That's per day. That's per day. Eight dollars and thirty-nine cents. I believe per day. So that comes to a little bit less than three dollars per meal. Um, that's what the con. That's what the the uh, not-for-profit is provided to spend for their food allocation as per their contract with DHS. My concern is that they, the incentive for the provider is to go with the lowest bidder that is out there um, providing these catering services because their contract is not flexible in that regard. They are, you know, they're provided their allotment for um, for food for for food services, um, and if they had an option to uh, have a caterer that could meet their needs but provides healthier food but cost more money, because healthier food does cost more money, um, that, because of fresher food or whole foods, um, that they wouldn't be able to do that, or their incentive would be, because every homeless provider has budgetary constraints. Um, I'm not gonna get into the, um, uh, some of the budget, you know, the kind of broader contracting and budgetary issues, but, um, suffice it to say that we've heard plenty about um, about contracting issues. So, how do we reconcile that, or how involved is this DHS in that specific question? Being that there's only two providers really that are have the I think the vast majority of the hotels, if not the, the entire hotel portfolio. Um, thank you for your question. It's a very very important questions. I believe that our providers are really committed to serve our population, especially the nonprofit providers. Um, we review the menus and we ensure that the menu meet the food standards, but I definitely uh, hear you in terms of the details of using the lowest bidder. Mm -hmm. um, given that we meet the nutrition standard and we meet the food safety standard, I'm pretty confident that um, the food uh, is nutritious and healthy, but I do hear your concern and that's something that we can uh, take back and discuss some more. Do we have a, um, any data on utilization of food, particularly in, in hotels? So how many, how many meals are actually being eaten? And with these focus groups, are we finding out how many times a week a family is getting food outside of the shelter? Yes, we do have that information. I don't have the data with me. From the um, surveys and focus group, we have some information on how much, uh, not exactly, but how much of their uh, money they spend on food, how much do they e eat in the shelter system. In addition, right. we also- You should know how many meals are not being eaten, right? I mean, that-, that Right, that and, we and that's what know. I was gonna say. In terms of meals uh, uh, received, though, so the shelter, a shelter with 200 bed, uh, received 200 meals, so there are discard reports on how many, so there are reports on how many are not being uh, served, which obviously vary from shelter to shelter, so uh, the tendency is that breakfast and lunch is used a lot more. I mean, breakfast and dinner is used a lot more, and, and lunch, whereas sure. lunch less, but they also can get a bag lunch if, uh, if uh, because it's available for people, but we can get you, we would have to get you the exact um, number of meals that are not being used. Absolutely, because they should be, if, 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 it was, if everything was running as, and as uh, best as it could run, that no, the, the, the number of meals not eaten should be very, very small because people should want to be able to eat the dinner that is catered, if it's a decent meal. Um, and, or, and, the, and the breakfast. If lunch is a different question, I understand. Um, but, but that remains, I mean, just, I saw it firsthand. I went out to a shelter, a hotel. I saw what, um, what was being provided. Um, it did not look particularly appealing. Uh, and 
it just, I, I, like, I'll just give you an example. I worked with a constituent for a, a long period of time through, a, through prior to entering shelter, it was a, 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 a woman and her 17-year-old daughter. They went to a family shelter, so I was working with them prior to entering shelter, throughout the full year that they were in shelter, and then, and then when they left shelter. Um, the, the mother told me that sh during that time, this was a city-run family shelter, of which there are very few, but this was one. And the mother told me that she, throughout that year, gained 20 pounds or 30 pounds, and her daughter lost 20 or 30 pounds. Um, which, and the entire time, I mean, I talked to her twice a week during that year, and the entire time she complained to me about the food and that she couldn't cook, because, you know, she was used to cooking when she had her home, and, and that she ended up eating out all the time. And it was causing all types of high blood pressure issues for her. And again, you know, obviously gaining or losing 20 or 30 pounds in a year, either direction is not good for one's health. Um, so that's just what I saw personally. Um, and so it, I think that it's something that we, my, my hunch is that there's, this is an, yet another instance where budget is driving policy. And that is very, very concerning because we are sacrificing quality because we don't want to pay an extra dollar or two per day for healthier food. So I'll leave it at that. I'll call on Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Doctor, for your testimony. Uh, a, few, a few questions. I just want to follow up on the, um, the hotels um, where the meals come in frozen. I believe so. You believe so? Um, how, so if, if not all the rooms have microwaves, is it there, the provider will have an area where they heat up the, the meals? That's and correct. Do you, do you have, um, could you provide um, the committee with a weekly menu of what a typical um, menu would be for a shelter, for a, I'm um, sorry, um, a hotel. Uh, Fro all frozen foods, right? That we can provide a menu. Could you, you a, we, a, a typical in the city of New York in a hotel, you can provide that. And yes. we can see what type, could you describe what a breakfast is? A breakfast might be a bowl of oatmeal, a piece of fruit, milk, um, a cup of juice. Um, lunch might be um, a chicken um, sandwich with uh, fruits and uh, vegetables on the side. A, um, and dinner might be roast chickens, mashed potato, um, peas and carrots, for example. Meals tend to be warm, hot food. And they have to be warmed. And so are there eggs in, in uh, yes. say for breakfast? Yes, or? we can, uh, eggs. So um, they don't get the same food every day. So one day might be oatmeal, one day might be cold cereal, um, one day might be uh, eggs. Uh, so what's pretty constant is that there will be fruits, there will be a uh, uh, container of milk. Um, and uh, so in terms of lunch, uh, they may have a you know, cup of you know, pasta with, uh, uh, with a side, um, different type of sandwiches. So, um, I mean, right. there's, so a you, so, so there's a four-week cycle menu that okay. where the, the, main, the, the meal change. Yeah, because I, I, I'm interested to see how these, not only the, the listing of the, the, uh, the menu of what they're being uh, fed, but... I'd like to see actual a photograph of what this food looks like um, and, and how it's been handled and how, if it's frozen, when was it frozen and expiration dates and so forth. I know it goes on, you, you said you inspect it. Do you inspect the, the food that's coming from providers that are going into hotels? You inspect that uh, so at, the so at the source where it's being frozen or? Uh, at delivery, so our work starts at delivery, so the food is inspected at delivery, so the food handlers, which exist in every uh, shelters, 
and have to be present uh, in the shelter at time of uh, delivery. They uh, will make sure that the food is frozen. So, so you, I just want to be clear, uh, where it comes from, where the, it's being prepared, it's not inspected? But not by DHS, because they are um, food caterers, so they have to follow USDA um, guidelines. So I'm sure they are inspected, but DHS doesn't inspect the uh, large food caterers that are providing food to many different places. Well, they're all in New York City, right? Or are they coming from out, out of um, the city? I know there's one in Long Island. There may be in, um, in other places, but I imagine that they are, that they are nearby. Does the Department so of Health visited inspect them? them. Um, so for the, for the most part, the suppliers are uh, subject to state inspection and not state inspection. For, so. for the most part, there might you know might depend on the details, but for the most part, the supplier would be uh, under state regulation. But, but so if they're in, if the providers are in New York City, you don't inspect. It, it's not it's not a, um, a the jurisdictional matter is not a lo location, but uh, the type of provider. Okay. When let, let's go to shelters now, um, the the kitchens in the shelters. How many? shelters, full, full shelters, do they all have kitchens? Um, no, so we have different type of shelters. Uh, the single adult shelters are congregate setting. They do not have, um, they do not have a kitchens. They are providing three meals a day. In the adult family shelters, a number of them are, um, you know, have kitchens or clients have microwaves in their room. Uh, for the others, they are uh, provided the meals. A large proportion of the family with children shelters have their own kitchen. They have their own kitchens. So uh, the, the kitchens that are in the central kitchen in a, in a, in a typical shelter, you said you inspect twice a year? And That's you have 20, 28 inspectors? That's correct. Are the inspections announced? Oh, good question. My, Cause we I, heard, we I heard, was imagining that they are not. I heard they were announced. Okay, so if you can just check that, because we're getting complaints that they were, they are they announced. Are so they clean it up, and we know the Department of Health doesn't announce. And I think it's convenient that if they're, if, and if it's true that they are announced, I think we need to, need to uh, you need to change that policy very quickly, because you, now the Department of Health comes in once a year, right? So we're ex inspecting at least once a year. At least we're, once a year. We, and w it would be more frequent, more frequent if we see things that need follow-up. So it's and at least once a year. Same standards as you would in inspect a restaurant. That's right. The rules are the same for all food service establishments, and the inspection is the same. And anybody been shut down? Anybody? You mean DA? Any, any, uh, yes. Any location that has a kitchen and a shelter where they just say you just shut them down like you do restaurants? Um, so the the protocol would be the same if we found a closure. Um, is required when we find what we call a public health hazard that can't be immediately corrected. And we did look back for a couple of years in preparation for this hearing, and we don't have a record of closure. You don't have any records. What about DHS? Uh, anybody sh gets shut down by you guys? Uh, no, we don't have any instances okay. of shelter that was food the service that was shut down. But I think that's important that we, we see what's going on in, in the shelters so we, we don't have incidents of food poisoning and, and other uh, health-related uh, issues. So that, that's important. Um, the obesity that half the school children are overweight in the city of New York, do you have figures on the shelter system? Is that the same, same uh, figures, you think? or? Um, we don't have those figures. They are not weighed uh, on when they enter. So, what, what I don't type of we have that what type of um, issues are you health issues are you seeing in the shelters mostly uh, amongst children? Um, asthma. Asthma. Mm -hmm. Asthma is, is is a large one. That, that I want to say by far the number one uh, health issue. And um, what about in adults? What, what would that be? Um, in adults, it's, it varies by um, groups. Uh, interestingly, in the adult in the, in, in the fam um, that are among families, they have a lot of asthma also. But uh, for the most part, you're seeing the same that you see in the general population. Diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, uh, back pain, joint pain. Um, th these are the, you know, the top uh, conditions. So. Um and I just want to go back one, I'm just thinking about this. If, if you're in a hotel with a family 
do you ever get fresh food? I'm, I'm talking about fresh vegetables, not frozen. Do you ever get that? So you could be the, in there for, for 14 months. Do you ever get anything fresh that's not frozen? I'll have to get back to you on that. They do get fruits that are fresh in well, addition to Yeah, you don't want you can't freeze most fruit. I mean, we wouldn't <laughs> But we know, yeah, that's that's a given. But what about I'm talking about vegetables which are important. Uh, some vegetables don't do well when when they're frozen as you know. Mm -hmm. um, so fresh fruit and vegetables should be actually required once a week, twice, I mean, it should be every day, but uh, if, if we can't do it, but it should be at some point, let's stop freezing everything every, every day and give people in shelters nutritious food uh, that's healthy, that's not just frozen and then just uh, put on a tray. I mean, I, so I think it, that needs to, we need to look at that uh, as a city. Um, so if you could if you could actually come up with a plan to do that, uh, we that would be I think beneficial. Um, okay, okay, I think that's it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. Councilmember Grudenchik. Thank you, Chair. Um, a little dismayed. I thought maybe somewhere I would hear that there was some kind of fresh food being served. By my math, the shelter system is serving tens of millions of meals a year. Um, if, I use the, the DHS numbers, approximately 60,000 people in the shelter system, and three meals a day would be 180,000 meals, and you can times that by 365. Next year it'll be 366. But um, are you telling us, doctor, that there's no fresh fruit, fresh cooking going on at all anywhere? Uh, I'm not really surprised because it's not happening in our school system either, and I'm old enough to remember when it did. Um, at Jamaica High School, NIAS 237, but um, I'll just ask you for the record. So um, the f food is provided in a variety of ways. So actually some shelters cook on site or receive food from another shelter that cook on site okay. and that's, that's fresh food. Okay, that's um, good some of them are receiving um, batch meals, so that, uh, that is uh, fresh food and um, a numbers do receive the, the frozen meal. In terms of uh, families, they actually have access to SNAP and um, they are uh, in the Plentiful app, and they are actually uh, able to um, receive, uh, you know, to get fresh food. We are also uh, trying to promote things like the health box, which is, you know, uh, fun to, 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 to go to, um, you know, use farmer's market, et cetera. But we hear you. So there are some places. Um, could you get back to the committee and let us know approximately how many of the shelters I'm not gonna hold you to an absolute percentage, but I'd be curious to know. I, I, I think um, the city of New York serves probably more meals in New York City than anybody else between schools and, and homeless shelters, um, prisons, uh, events that the city holds. Um, there's, uh, I would like to think there's more and more fresh cooking going on, but I'm not so sure that there is. Um, Do you know what the budget is for food in the shelter system for the whole year? I mean, I could do the math, but I'm sure that the, you throw in bureaucracy, the number is probably even higher. Uh, yes, so uh, for the directly run facility, for, for the facility uh, for whom we provide food, the uh, budget is about 17 million, and in addition, the provider run facilities have a budget of 35 million per year. That doesn't seem to add up, to be honest with you, because if you take, that's $52 million. My math is correct, Mr. Chairman? Okay, 17 and 35. Professor Holden, 17 and 35, 52? Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, if we're dealing with approximately 60,000 people in the shelter system, at $8.39 a day, 60,000 times eight would be 480,000, and you add another 0.4, so that's another 24,000. So let's say 500,000, just to be fair, round it down a little. Um, we're looking at $175 million, $182.5 million a year at $8.39 per, per person. 
And that's nowhere near the $52 million that you tell me that it's at. How's my math? My math, the, 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 the fourth estates confirm my math. So I would be interested in knowing why there's such a large discrepancy in what your numbers are and what um, my numbers are. I mean, I'm married to a math professor, full disclosure, so I just want you to know that. Um, so I would like to know, would like you to get back to, to this committee, the chair and the staff and uh, all the members and let us know exactly what we're paying for food because I would think before we can determine where we're going, um, we need to know where we're coming from and the number, the dollar number um, is very, very important because um, I'm seeing a lot more money being spent, um, more than triple what the official source is from the administration. Certainly. Okay. So I thank you. Um, I, I will wait for those numbers, and um, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Grudenchik. Um, I'm going to go through a few more questions, and I um, want to be conscious of your time. Um, there is, I met with, um, there's a, a program that we support out of the council um, uh, through Project Renewal um, that has a, um, uh, trains clients in, in, um, in their, you know, getting a food handler's license and culinary program. Um, and they have an affiliated um, uh, not-for-profit caterer company called, um, uh, I believe it's City Beats, hold on a second, I have the name of it, City Beat, City Beat Kitchens, um, and they are, they are, con they are a contractor provider with some, with some, um, um, uh, shelter providers. Um, my understanding is that they are, right now, as, as a not-for-profit, that, that as a, is mission-driven, it, it obviously hires, um, uh, former clients, um, that within the market there are, as, we, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, other catering companies that are kind of have entered the market and are essentially um, uh, underbidding or bidding lower amounts. Um, and so I just, uh, I'm not, I don't, you don't need to speak specifically about a particular uh, provider or company that's, or not-for-profit, uh, that's not what I'm getting at. But um, how does DHS pr approach the issue of mission-driven providers or not-for-profit -pro providers um, in all of this? Because again, as I said, you know, every not-for-profit or every shelter provider, um, uh, even with the model budget stuff that went into place last year um, struggles to figure out how to pay the bills every month and um, and pay their staff and retain their staff um, and and so when when they're able to save some money on a caterer. Um, I mean, that's what's happening now. We, I think that we're, we're seeing that happen going in, into place. And so I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering how, um, if you could fill us in a little bit on how the, the real, what the relationship is between you know, your office and DHS's Office of Budget and OMB on questions like this. Like, because um, if we're seeing, you know, in reality that we're getting more and more um, uh, kind of uh, larger providers that might not be mission driven or might just, you know, and, and, and the not for profits themselves don't have much of a choice. They have to try to meet their budget needs. I can speak a little bit more in a general sense to that question. Thank you for your question and the, for the opportunity to talk about our turning the tide plan. So DHS has a, a plan to raise the bar, we define our services, we look at them, we've been raising the bar. So as part of that, we, our plan is to work, uh, is to, uh, work more with um, 
um, mission-driven providers. That, that's the idea. You're absolutely right. We want to work with mission-driven providers and, and phase out uh, more commercial providers. Um, in terms of uh, the budget relationship with OMB, my office provide advice, um, guidance on, on food and other areas. In terms of the direct work with OMB, that would be the executive office of uh, our department, obviously, that would work with that. Um. I'd like to ask about like special needs, um, medical needs, um, dietary restrictions, um, religious religious needs um, when it comes to diet. Um, how are those needs met? You mentioned you know a uh, an example um, menu for um, uh, for hotels. How does that? How, what are, the, are there for every single resident? There's is there a vegetarian halal kosher option? Yes, um, uh, absolutely. So I'll first start by saying that for most chronic disease, diabetes, hypertension, the uh, regular standard menu, because it meets the food standard and set, uh, say, less than 2,300 uh, uh, milligrams of sodium, it set the amount of uh, fibers and sugar, that, that uh, diet that meets the food standard is um, a, a, a satisfied most chronic disease mm -hmm. in terms of on the medical side, but we understand our clients have a lot of uh, uh, chronic diseases. So if there is um, a diet that is more restricted than what the food standard can provide, then there is a reasonable accommodation process, which is a standard process where a client can uh, request uh, a more strict diet. For example, if you have renal disease on dialysis, you may need less potassium even, and so they can request that type of meals. Um, in terms of the but non- you need a doctor's note for that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the, um, and we also, we, uh, we have a process that reviews a doctor's note. We will help client get the note if that's, if that's difficult. So we really support them through the process. In terms of the non-medical meal, the halal, we provide halal, kosher, uh, vegan, vegetarian, uh, puree diet. Um, so yes, we do accommodate for religious meal. Um, are there any consequences if a provider is not adhering to food standards, or what's the uh, remediative effort in that sense, or in that, in that case? Right. So we believe that working with our providers and providing technical assistance and, and, and tools and review uh, their product and, and get back to them um, works, and it's been a pretty effective in getting them to uh, to apply the corrective action. I mean, they really welcome the support of a nutritionist, and um, it generally that works. If um, something is more serious or they don't, then there is a process for compliance. They may be called for a pre-conference, there'll be a discussion, they'll have to write a corrective action plan, and if that uh, still doesn't work, then they, uh, they will have a, 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 a regulatory um, compliance uh, conference meeting in person. Um, we have it in our um, in our report that shelters are exempt from nutrition requirements if um, or the nutri nutrient requirement of the food standards if they are regularly serving fewer than 200 meals 200 people per meal is that is that true? That was correct before we had a nutritionist. Now okay. that we have a nutritionist, uh, no one is exempt, and she's been working very closely with them to. Uh, uh, review their menus. They have to create menus that are very detailed with all the nutrient, uh, the, the nutrient content. She gets the menu, enter them into a um, nutrition uh, software, and analyze uh, all the requirement, add everything for the day, and make sure that they meet the food standard. If they don't meet the food standard, then she'll get back to them and say, "Hey, you need to correct item X, Y, or Z." For any, because there are plenty of hotels that are less than 200 people, I believe, right? Um, Okay. Um, going back to the hotels, there. So when, for something like a dinner, it's microwavable because it's frozen. Um, if it's six thirty and there are, I mean, I went to one of the hotels where I, I, you know, I saw where people are getting their food. It's one small hotel room because it's a hotel, and. Um, 
uh, and it had a, you know big boxes of food and like a, I think I saw like one microwave. Is there so? There are presu dinner time is dinner time. Um, how are how do, do they, you know, people standing in line waiting to microwave their meals? So microwaving a frozen meal could take six or seven minutes. Um, you got your meal, two or three kids. That's that's like 20 minutes, and there are you know 60 families. I mean, how does that work? Uh, right. We are very concerned with the health and well-being of our families, and we understand that uh, hotels are not the ideal location for our family, which is why we want to face them and have purpose-built shelters. Right. I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. In fact, I, I know it's, it's kind of common uh, wisdom that the clusters are the worst and the hotels are not as bad. I think hotels are worse than clusters in a lot of ways, because at least clusters you have a, a kitchen. Um, but I have been in, I've been on the, a member of this committee for almost 10 years. I am pretty sure that hotels are going to be part of our portfolio um, for the foreseeable future. I would be very surprised in five years if we are entirely out of hotels. And I'd be surprised if in 10 years we are entirely out of, of hotels. Um, I'd be shocked in five years if we were out. So what do we, I mean, what's the, what's the, what is the daily experience of shelter residents and hotels in trying to just get their frozen meal unfrozen and warmed up so that they could serve it to their kids? Um, yeah, I do understand, and, and, and my heart, our heart at DHS really goes um, to the client. Uh, the, the issue of having not enough microwave is, is a real one, um, and, uh, uh, because of the right to shelter, we, can, we have to have capacity for, for everyone, and our plan is really to tr really try very hard not to have hotels. But people do wait in line at a microwave. That's my understanding that it does happen. Yeah. Um, if a there, microwave does not work, but I, I believe there are two. Micro there, 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 there's more than one. And if it doesn't work, they get really fixed or replaced right away. That doesn't okay. wait. Um, Okay, this is something I'm going to look into more because, again, if there are 60 families, you know, mm -hmm. times three, it's 180 meals. You just can't possibly cook that. You know, three, 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 three meals per family. I mean, it's just it, it seems entirely arduous um, to be able to. I mean, that's like, th I mean, I, I would imagine those microwaves would probably burn out pretty quick if they're running it for three hours a night or something like that from six to nine. But it's also just, I mean, you know, people have their lives and, you know, uh, you shouldn't have to wait in line for, for an hour to, to get your, your, um, your TV dinner made. I mean, it's, it's, right. not, it's not a really, it's a, it, on top of the indignity of living in a hotel, which is just, I mean, I can't even get into how detrimental, and as the medical director, I think you, you probably agree that living in a hotel room for a year and a half is so, so devastating. I mean, I, just thinking about this morning, I could, I, could bar I could barely tell my daughter about it. And I think about families and children living it for a year or two years. I mean, I didn't even want to, I didn't even, I didn't even want to tell my daughter. It is, it is devastating. It is devastating for these children. And because they have nowhere to play, there's no recreation space, they can't go to after school because we can't figure out a way to coordinate it for kids in shelter to go to after school because they can't get transportation home. They are, they, their, their recreation consists of running up and down the hallways in a hotel. Um, it is, it is just psychologically, developmentally, um, emotionally, and physically horrible. And so we ought to figure out a way that they can just eat dinner in a dignified way. 
Thank you for your concern. Yes, as the medical director and public health specialist, uh, I agree with you that um, uh, homeless families are in need, and our mission is to help them through that need, through um, various processes. I mean, our uh, family with children divisions work with families very closely to provide support. Um, again, the non-hotel facilities may have daycare, they have a, a playroom, so which is why, again, we want to move to, oh, to, yeah. to tier two shelters. We are working, for example, also with the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, Committee on Vulnerable Children. That's a, a project that we have to help uh, to have pediatric residents come and, and speak to families. That's that's an additional project. So we are trying to kind of you know think uh, uh, outside of the uh, box, but also collaborate. I mean, we are DHS. We don't have necessarily the resource and manpower to do everything. So that's why we like to collaborate, collaborate closely with the Department of Health and, and sister agencies and nonprofits and and others to really uh, improve the system. Um, along those lines, um, I want to ask about the relationship between um, DHS and school food. Um, every child uh, that's four or older is likely in a school setting for a good portion of their day. Um, and as Councilman Orlander said, we've made a lot of progress with school food over the last decade. What is the What's that relationship like, for especially for kids that are in that are in hotel setting or in a in a in a shelter setting that does not have a kitchen? Um, uh, to go back to the microwave um, situation, oh, if sure. you hear of anything, any complaint, let us know, please. We I will look into it right away. Or Absolutely. any other issues, uh, you have been in you're in the community, and therefore let us know, and that is valid for any members of this committee. We will for sure. Um, we work very closely with DOE. I will have to get back to you in terms of the school food specifically, but mm -hmm. um, DHS work very, very closely with the DOE. Our uh, Family with Children Division has a liaison. DOE has staff in shelters. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but in, uh, specifically with, you know, with school food, I will have to um, get back to you on that. Okay, because there's, I mean, perhaps there's an opportunity where School food could provide hot meals, you know, to take home, right? You know, there's where they're cooking on site, obviously, in their cafeteria. Um, yeah, we should just figure out a way to make sure that families are getting a hot meal at night. Um, okay, Councilmember Holden. Just to follow up to the chair's remarks on closing cluster sites. Um, and being very proud of the fact that they were closing cluster sites and putting families in hotels without a kitchen. Uh, I, I, if I'm in a, a cluster site. I'd rather have a kitchen and be able to cook my meals and fresh, have fresh food than be thrown into a, um, a small room with a family and, and only eat frozen food. Um, so I don't know why the, this administration was so proud on closing cluster sites without having a backup plan and without um, just having the hotels as a site. So I never bought that argument um, unless it was being done by for developer friends. I don't know why they were closing cluster sites so fast when they had no backup. Uh, if you, you have, you close the cluster sites if you have a better alternative. The hotels were not a better and still are not a better alternative than the cluster sites. Uh, that was convenient and uh, there's, that needs to be looked at as to why that decision was made. Um, think of a life in a hotel room, think of years in a hotel room uh, with only, with no fresh food. Think about that. And again, if you had a choice, what would you make? You, I would certainly want to live in a cluster site with a kitchen, at least a kitchen at least a little bit more space than be thrown into a ho hotel. So that needs to be looked at as to why that decision was made. And, it was, and the administration was so proud of it. So I can't figure that out. I argued then, and I'll argue now, that that's not an alternative to put somebody in a hotel room for over a year with a, with a family. So we need to look at that as to why that was done. And um, I never understood it, and I still don't. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member uh, Thank you, Chair. I, I, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. I think it's uh, uh, shi shined a very uh, interesting spotlight on some of the practices that we've been hearing about today. Um, I, I want to put into the record, based on, and I want to thank you for being here today, Dr. LaRock and, and uh, Deputy Commissioner. Um, based upon 
what we're hearing today, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we've heard testimony that indicates that less than two and a half percent of all the spending on homeless services in the city of New York goes to food. And I would argue that um, that is a very, very low number. Um, I think the average family probably spends much more than two and a half percent of their total budget on food. Um, and so uh, I think that's something that we need to bring up with, um, with Commissioner Banks, who is the Social Service Commissioner, when he's uh, before this committee again. And I know he'll be here again shortly because budget time is just around the corner. So um, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for allowing me the time. And again, thank the DHS staff for being here today. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for your time and testimony and for answering our questions um, so thoroughly. Uh, we really appreciate you, you taking the time with us. Um, if you can stick around for the first panel, because uh, we have um, uh, clients who are, who are set to testify, so if you can stay for uh, another 20 minutes or so, that would be greatly appreciated. Certainly. Thank you. Okay. It's a large panel, but it's a large panel. <laughs> That's okay. I will stay. Um, um, Lily Knopf, Froska McAllister, Likael Booker, Sharifa Harvey, Katrina Corbell, CCB, is that right? And Janet Perry. And whoever wants to begin. Oh, sorry, and the, yeah, if the red light is on. And there's uh, three minutes for, for, te uh, for testimony. Okay. Hi, good morning. My name is Sharifa Harvey, and I am I'm a member of the Client Advisory Group at the Coalition for the Homeless. And in June of last year, I was denied religious accommodation when I entered shelter at the Franklin Women's Intake and Assessment Shelter in the Bronx. Um, upon my arrival to the shelter, I immediately informed the intake specialist of my need for religious accommodation. It was Ramadan. She explicitly denied any religious accommodation, saying it was against the rules. So I asked to speak with a supervisor, and she denied that request. After intake, I called 311 to report the incident, spent the next five days going through official channels including the ombudsman's office, trying to enforce my religious right to eat in the shelter at the prescribed times. The first day I was allowed to eat on the front steps outside the shelter, and if you're familiar with that shelter, you know exactly what that's like. It was dark, and that's not a place to be eating. Um, and then the next day I was made to eat on the steps, and then I was told to go out off the steps and go across the street. If you're familiar with that area, then you know this is not appropriate. So then um, this should never have happened not upon intake, nor for the next five days, and it took the um, director of social services five days to finally get, to finally notify staff to let me come in and eat food at, one, at this prescribed time, and that was the last day of Ramadan. So I I'm, I'm want to encourage DHS administration to remind shelter management and staff that they are to provide religious accommodation, especially during Ramadan, and if they're unable to do so, they are to notify the administration immediately and explain why they're unable to do so. Now, I, hold, hold, I heard Dr. LaRock talk about how there are kosher and halal meals. I have, at, at every intake that I've been in, um, I've been told that there is no such a thing. It doesn't exist. They laugh when, I, when they, they have a little check mark on the form and they laugh whenever, whenever I say halal or kosher. Either one will work. So um, this is not acceptable. And when they say that they have it, they do not. 
Um, I'm not here to also talk about the quality. I'm just here to talk about the dietary restric restrictions. One of the other issues is that with the prepackaged meals, they have meals that have ingredients in them, like wine sauce. I can't eat the meal. I never know what's going to be in the food, so I always, I, I rarely eat anything in the shelters. I'm always using my, the, food that I, the food money that I have to eat outside. That's not acceptable. And, and in the previous shelter that I was in, I couldn't bring in any fresh food. It would spoil. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of resources. And it's a waste of time going from place to place to place trying to find food in, um, every evening and making sure that you don't have anything on your person that's going to spoil. It's a waste. So that's, that's been my experience, and I wanted to make sure that this was known. Thank you. Are you in a setting right now where you're able to cook your own food? Absolutely not. So, so there's. Um... I can bring in food, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be prepared foods. I'm able to actually bring in a salad and, and get creative now, but I, but I was not able to do that before. Do you have a refrigerator? No, not at all. And for, as far as the um, microwaves in the, the shelter that I was in, there was, it's the pre-made pre, uh, pre meals. The, there were three microwaves. Two of them went out of service one day because some, one of the staff accidentally ruined them. So we were working with like one microwave to, for all of those meals for about a month. How many? Uh, there's about 100 per, clients in that. 100 in that clients. Shelter. How long was, were people waiting? Um, because I'm coming in and out, I'm not seeing the, but when, I'm, when I have to use a microwave for soup, mm -hmm. then it's going to be a wait if I'm not getting down there just at the right time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Danny Perry. This is my second go around where the food is not edible in these shelters. Uh, comfort foods, the ambassador that ordered them need to be held accountable to where they are getting their food from because they are sending it right to the shelters. I had the experience where in Franklin Women's Shelter, we had to put a petition together, get comfort foods into the shelter and talk to them to why we're not getting fresh food, why our eggs are green, to the point where as for three weeks, they send us fresh food and resort back to the old green eggs and we're trying to understand why y'all keep serving us this bad food. Who's searching in this food to y'all to send to us? Who's overseeing ambassador and comfort foods where they get in their food from that is going into the shelters? These, these clients have been getting sick. We had to put out petition, comfort foods, tells us how they make their chicken. They say they use chicken scraps to make chicken patties. I never heard nothing like this. Where are their foods coming from that they can send right to the shelters? And sometimes they know it's not edible, but they send it anyhow. Who is overseeing these people in the um, catering business that's sending the food to the shelters? We need assistance in that. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just uh, so uh, and, and Comfort Food, they're, they're the ones, they're the, they're the contracted provider. They're, 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 you mentioned two companies, is that right? Yes, it's, it's Ambassadors, it's Comfort yes. Foods, it's Westons. But where are they getting their food from and why are they taking the food that comes to them knowing it's bad and still send it to the shelters? Right, right. And this okay. is at Franklin? Yes. And, and, and Franklin or and, and anywhere else? It, this is, at Franklin, the director worked with us and got the company to come send it and send somebody in to talk to us, and that's how we grilled him. But then again, who would the, the food that's going to them, who's overseeing them, watching them prepare it correctly before it goes to the shelter? I'm assuming they're not even in the city. Maybe yeah. they're not. Uh, no, I'm, some of them are in the city. Oh, okay. Some of them are. Yeah, in Brooklyn. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And it's, mm -hmm. I very much appreciate the testimony. Thank you. A little bit of a musical chairs. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Good morning. I really appreciate being here. My name is LaKayla Booker. Um, I'm a former graduate, graduate, graduate of AmeriCorps. Um, and also, when I was younger, I had an opportunity to work with um, Job Corps. And my reasons of explaining this is that um, due to circumstances of some women that are in the shelter, 
um, they have came to me and expressed to me that they have had serious illnesses such as cancer, um, gallbladder surgery, um, and, and just many uh, different illnesses that they have, uh, con uh, you know, went through. And the food that has been served as I have been there and witnessed is just horrible. Um, it, it's, it really hurts my heart. Um, and to hear that people that I've met that I've never spoken to that walked up to me to tell me that they are dying of cancer and have to actually eat the food there that is just like slop. Um, so um, the, the lady that was sitting here that's over the, I guess, the medical food uh, what have you, she expressed that she's trying to think outside of the box. Um, thinking outside of the box is taking uh, consideration of going to different uh, v various uh, schools, colleges that has culinary arts um, institutes, uh, Job Corps that has a, a culinary arts institute, those that are at a higher level of that degree of cooking and have such volunteers as far as AmeriCorps um, to come into the shelters. I am, as I stated before, an AmeriCorps graduate. We would, we would be so happy to assist certain uh, um, operations such as DHS. To, to volunteer our, t our time, to make sure that the food is correctly served, cooked, well nourished. So thinking outside of the box is thinking outside of the box. So I am here to represent the women of the shelters, uh, Coalition for the Homeless, to express our concerns. We are grateful and we need a change with the food. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, well, thank you. Turn this on. My name is Fruska McAllister. I am here on behalf of Urban Justice Safety Net Activists. I'm also a resident of Bushwick Homeless Shelter in Brooklyn. It currently houses or has approximately 200 beds, having recently been expanded from 165. I've been there way too long. When I first came there, from another shelter. Uh, within less than two months, I was on special uh, vitamin program that was prescribed by my doctor because she told me I was suffering from malnutrition. It's not surprising, considering the offerings that they provide at this shelter. It's a provider, it's a subcontractor, or what do they call providers? Camba, uh, is what this young lady described for me, slop. I wouldn't feed it for the most part to any of my children. I only had two, they're all gone, thank goodness. I mean adults, I don't mean. <laughs> okay, breakfast is instant oatmeal or Cheerios, prepared with 1% or 2% milk, which for the most part, most of the ladies can't drink or digest. They take it anyway because they need the calcium. They want the milk. They're accustomed to drinking milk. But we can't drink it so much anymore. Not at 1% or 2%. There is no offering 95% of the time of even skim milk. In addition, with respect to the microwave, if you want the hot cereal, that is the instant oatmeal, you do have to wait online to get it into the one microwave, one microwave, whereby everybody has to wait. It could be 20 minutes before you get it in there. At other times, the microwave, depending on the wattage of the microwave, it could be longer because after it gets into the machine, it may take five minutes to do a little bit of boiling water or whatever it is that they do. In addition, some of the women, because the, the milk issue is such a problem, have been given to the habit of heating the milk, thinking that somehow if that, that changes how their body processes it. 
It doesn't necessarily, but they feel better uh, when they are up chucking the milk or have the runts. They think they don't do it so much when they do that to the milk. Lunch consists of primarily a sandwich, rotted or really, really bad fruit. It may come to the shelter, not so bad. I don't know. I've not really seen it when it wasn't so bad. And then what they do with it, it seems, is that they put things like bananas in the refrigerator. Bananas don't go into the refrigerator. The lunch, usually the, this is the dessert and the fruit, uh, is a banana or an apple or an orange. Texture is bad, taste is bad, appearance is bad. I mean, really, really bad. It's not something that you would want to even look at, let alone eat. The sandwiches, tuna salad, chicken salad. Uh, turkey ham and cheese on a whole wheat bread, cheese sandwich, peanut butter and jelly, juice, but it's not juice. It's fructose drink, something else I wouldn't give to a child. I didn't let my children drink that when they were children. I wouldn't give it to a grown-up person. And they're minis. They're not even a regular size drink. The portion size also is something to be remarked upon because they're feeding grown women, older women, many of us, many with compromised systems because that particular shelter is largely what they call a mica shelter. So you have compromised medical conditions that are being offered this food. And they're being, anyway, uh, the lunch, the sandwich, the whole wheat bread, and sometimes, what else they, and some other things that usually are hard to identify. And when I say hard to identify, they're, they're con combinations or concoctions that I've never really seen before. And I'm over 70 years old, and I've seen a lot. I saw every day I'm surprised at some of the things that are offering. The dinner. I haven't seen too many dinners, in truth, because I try not to be there. Sometimes it's very inconsistent. The quality is generally poor. You can depend on that. But the inconsistency is, it seems so unnecessary. You'll have the little whatever, the batch thing that comes in, and They'll have vegetables. Lately, I've been seeing green vegetables, which makes my heart feel good. I love greens. And they'll have broccoli. It may, some, may be frozen or it might be overcooked. But it doesn't have a taste. Why would it have a taste? I, you know, we don't really need to have food taste. Um, I, before I came here, I was speaking to one of the security guys. And I said, you know, I'm going to be talking at the city council. And he said, a, about what? I said about the food. He says, oh, yeah. <laughs> he works. He's staff. He says, when I first came there, I was stunned at women that were getting three mini meatballs, mini meatballs. He said that might not have really been meatballs at all. They might have been soy balls, mini. And then the glee that sometimes the director would take in not having seconds, and uh, am I finished, time-wise? You can, you can. I'm sorry. Wrap up. It's fine. Don't worry about wrap it. Wrap up. I'm extremely concerned about the testimony of the person that was speaking earlier, um, because I have come to think of these be this behavior on the part of. Now, I'm not saying it happens everywhere. I haven't been everywhere. I'm only talking about this shelter. Uh, but there is, seems to be, they seem to have weaponized the food. Not only are you homeless, not only are you uh, have a tremendous loss of your own personal privacy, but you are being beat over the head with the breadstick, you know, as if eating is a privilege, that it's not an entitlement, that you should be hungry all the time. That is the characteristic that I would say 
is prevalent at the shelter I'm at. The women are hungry all the time. Uh, either they, if they want more, they may or may not get seconds. It's like, well, we'll decide, even though they're gonna be seconds because so many most don't. of the people don't eat. <laughs> right. The, the, the garbage of, can is filled yeah. every day. I was teaching a couple of years ago at a, a junior high school, or what they call the middle school now, and I was amazed at how much food gets thrown out because it really was not good food. Yeah. But the food at this shelter is worse than that junior high school food. And it's even worse for the people because it creates a very ugly atmosphere. In this kind of an environment, when people are hungry, they're angry when they're, they're depressed, they're, they're gonna act out. Yeah. There's no person that is gonna be badly behaved if they've had a comfortable meal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Councilmember Grudenchik wants to ask. Yes. We'll move on to the next testimony and then, and then uh, Councilmember Grudenchik will, will ask a question. Okay, so um, I have a lot of allergies. Um, I'm gluten-free. I can't, I also have um, uh, different, uh, I guess you could say like medical issues. So I can't have tomatoes, lemon, broccoli, cauliflower, and beans. Um, so that makes things like, you know, it's hard in a certain way because that's all the cheap ingredients that people would s just throw in, but you can have everything without it if you just cook without it. Um, so, I went to the hospital multiple times because I was told, for example, that the pasta was tofu. Um, I had breathing problems when I ate it, and then I felt tight in my, th my throat or my chest, and my legs and joints were swelling with agonizing pain, um, but nothing changed. Um, unfortunately, um, DHS didn't, didn't, didn't change anything. Um, people who can eat the food usually throw up or have a lot of bathroom issues. That's like a known thing already. Um, Therefore, 70% of the people um, would eat only one meal a day. Oh, okay. Um, I've heard from. Oh, I'm sorry, I, if you can identify yourself for the record. Oh, sorry, I'm Lily. Hi, Lily. Um, I've heard from, because I asked around, you know, I've heard from people who used to go to Susan's place, and now they're where I'm at. Um, Susan's Place has a cook, but the quality is poor, so clients there feel the same way about the food. Um, if someone went to an appointment or had something to do during meal time, they were um, not able to make the, the, during that time, they were not able to be there, they cannot get the food. Um, food portions are half the size of a small meal. So this is one meal I actually brought. Um, I've actually had this meal two weeks ago uh, for three days straight, and I've also had it two weeks before that for about three days straight. They order like a lot, and it's the same meal, so you have lunch and dinner, the same thing. Um, the rice here is stale. If you touch it, you can actually feel it. I tried eating this last night as well. It's, it's really not good. This hamburger here, it's one hamburger, um, and it's, it's actually like, it's gluten. I can't have it. So the only thing you can really eat here are these veggies, which are canned veggies. Anyone can tell these are ve canned veggies. They don't really give you um, uh, salads or, or any raw veggies that you need. Um, sorry, is there an expiration date on it? Nothing, nothing's on it. So you don't know if the burger, you know. That's no, and I actually got this frozen also. Okay. That's another thing. Yeah. Um, they tend to freeze a lot of their food. So, so oh yeah, the council member Holden's gonna, can we, can we take sure. a look at it? Yeah, it, you could touch the rice, it's, it's hard. You can't mush it, usually rice you can mush. You can't, right, you can't mush that. That's like a meal for a six-year-old. Like you can't, that's half a meal even. That's, mm -hmm. You know, they should put other things in it or not. Um, uh, I know someone who opened up an orange juice bottle and we saw all mold inside it. Um, there's usually more carbs served than nutri nutritionists, uh, yeah, sorry, nu foods that have nutrients in it, such as pasta, sandwiches, rice, fake mashed potatoes, instead of like chicken or soup or raw veggies. Um, Many times, I, ha uh, I said that, sorry. Uh, there have been mice a lot in the cafeteria. Um, they say they spray it. I don't see them spray it. It could be they spray it, but there's no traps whatsoever. Um, 
Um, I, I've been in and out of the shelter for, unfortunately, many years. Um, I, at one point, I was in a shelter for 24 and under, um, and they didn't have any of these things that I could eat. So I had like five apples a day and a carton of milk, and I was going to school, and I was not able to focus whatsoever to the point I was standing at that time. I had this accident for three years. But before that, I was standing. I was very athletic, and um, I, I, I couldn't walk properly because it was just I couldn't eat properly. And uh, that really affected me. Um, now, these meals, uh, because I'm not eating properly, um, I'm actually a full-time student now in college. And also, I was in an IT support program. I don't know if you heard of Prescola's. It's a well-known program. Um, I actually got dismissed from the program because I was always so hungry. I was always tired. I, was always, I couldn't focus straight, you know. Um, and now, I'm also, let's say, taking pre-calc in Kingsboro. And, and uh, my GPA was a 3.56. And now, it's a, since I went to the shelter system, it's now a 3.4, and not, and it's it's just getting lower because the last test I had, I failed. And I'm an A student. Before this, I was A's. So um, that's another thing. Um, um, the kitchen staff for the meals that, let's say, I eat kosher, so for the, for the, um, a lot of times that's given to clients who don't need to eat kosher, only because they don't want to eat something else. Um, and then I'm stuck. And then let's say I'll be eating this meal and sometimes, oh, I want that, and they'll grab it for me and nobody would do anything. Not the security, not the kitchen staff, nobody would do anything. Um, uh, let me just see. Sometimes when there is no food, sometimes like I, I actually had my boyfriend, he was in, in, uh, in the hospital over the weekend, um, this past weekend, I, I would come back usually thinking there's more meals. There was nothing in the refrigerator whatsoever that was kosher or anything that I could eat. Um, and I'm asking for five dollars to go and get myself something to eat, and they're like, "Well, we can't give you money." But when there was one point when the laundry was like the washer or whatever wasn't working, everybody got five dollars to do laundry, and people would actually even take advantage of it and be like, "Oh, you know, I'm doing laundry again. I'm doing laundry again," and like they'll just they'll just take the money. But here, I need to eat something and I can't have it. And then I have uh, vertigo and I get seizures if I don't eat properly, and I continuously go into the hospital for that as well because I'm not eating. So my like it's like a, an average um, month. I mean, even an average every every two weeks or so, I'm in the hospital for about four times. So it's 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 getting or, like out of proportions. Oh. So I also I just want to mention one more thing. Um, unfortunately, like I at one point I was I was studying in um, the cafeteria. I had permission to study. I was able to do there. It was a change of shift of security guards, and that new security guard did not want me to be in the room with her. She just was being weird, um, and she stabbed me. So because of that, I was able to meet with the head of DHS, three people. Um, they said that they're going to help me out with the foods. Um, and, be, and I thought I was very fortunate to actually have that be opportunity because at least if I was stabbed, at least I got something out of it. No, they didn't do anything. So I just want to mention all of that. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. I, um, and it, congratulations on being in, in school. Uh, you're Trying. At, sorry? Trying. Trying, trying. Um, and you said you're at Kingsborough? Yeah, at Kingsborough. I got already kicked out of the IT program because I wasn't focusing well. So. That, that was also at CUNY? Um, no, uh, it's, um, it's a not-for-profit program, but okay. they also are accredited towards any CUNY school. It's, um, and as closely went there, it's a very like well-known thing. Mm. The bankers go and try to uh, interview us and try to get us jobs and whatnot. So it's a very big, well-known um, thing. It's, it. it's two years of school and 15 weeks. Okay. Um, and you're like a geek squad when you when you're done. Okay. Basically. Um, with with CUNY, the, we've we've been working with CUNY, um, and and Barry can speak to it as well, and Council Member uh, Barron, on on uh, ensuring that CUNY is playing a role in making sure that all their students are you know are well fed, and and so CUNY has been making some progress. Soledad O'Brien just did a report on it, and on and on uh, I, I don't know where it was broadcast, but. It's, it's something that is kind of is more front center, so certainly. Well, the food um, in all the communities, they don't take SNAP, so, and then it's like double or triple the price that you would actually yes. pay. Right. And then with even with single stop or any of those pantries, it's canned food. You're gonna hold a can, can yep. the whole, uh, opener the whole time. You know, it's not like you have real food that you can really yeah. get. Yeah. So it's, and then you can't bring the food to the shelter, so what are you gonna do with it? Right. You know. right. And do you have uh, where you're staying a refrigerator? 
Um, they, no, we're not allowed to really use a refrigerator or anything. Um, you don't um, have a kitchen, obviously. No, no, I'm in a regular singles place. I was in a DV and I moved to a singles. Okay. So. Um, thank you for being here and testifying. Um, yeah. I r greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katrina and I'm with the Client Advisory Group with Coalition for the Homeless. I am currently at a project renewal shelter in Manhattan. Um, and I will be submitting the written testimony later in this week. Um, my shelter is one of the shelters that restricts um, bringing in any food, any food item, even any food enhancer, like your own salt or your own um, instant coffee. My neurologist actually prescribes coffee to treat migraines, and the shelter won't let me bring in um, the coffee packet, even with the doctor's letters. Um, so one example for me personally was last December, um, food I ate at a lunch made me so sick I had to go to urgent care. Urgent care sent me to the ER. Um, I ended up losing my bed because I was in an MRI during the 10 o'clock curfew. Um, and it, we ended up deciding- Sorry, and how long had you been there when that, ha like how long had you been at that shelter when that happened? Um, I had been at that shelter for about six weeks. Um, and what the doctors and I figured out, or the closest thing to an answer we had was that it was the amount of vinegar in three of the ingre or three of the entre three of the dishes served um, at the same meal. And so my body was reacting to too much vinegar or too much acid in all of the food. And where did you go then that night? Because you couldn't go to that shelter because you missed um, No, the shelter just had me stay in the cafeteria all night. Um, they did not do the right to bed or right to something coalitions helped me learn. Um, right so for the next you. two nights, I had to um, stay in the cafeteria until my until I could not keep sitting up because I could not keep my muscles up. So then I went to the ER again just for the right to sleep in a bed. Um, so we figured out that I can no longer eat the potato salad or the macaroni salad or the three bean salads because of the amount of vinegar in those side dishes. Um, and that's what I've been having to do for the past 12 months is remind the, <coughs> remind the cafeteria that I cannot eat those side dishes. Um, I've turned in medical letters from my doctors that say um, the foods I can eat and the foods I cannot eat. And my, um, my then case manager said, well, then you can use your SNAP benefits to go buy the foods you need and eat them outside the shelter. We're not going to help you. Um, Overall, the shelter has made some minor steps of improvement. For instance, in April, they started having soy milk, which was a surprise to all of us. Um, and then in June, they started having some plant-based options, which was, again, a shock. We don't know for sure when they started to grow a heart, but we are grateful for that. Um, Sorry, where, where is the shelter? Um, it is the- or You don't have to say if you don't want to, but I was- uh, It's New Providence okay. um, in Manhattan. The only catch is we do not have any choice. I'm a vegetarian. Um, I'm also in um, a, it's a, um, oh my, so between my allergist and my pulmonologist, my neurologist and my um, registered dietitian, they all work with me on, it's just called like a, um, like acid, restriction there's like a fancy word for it but it basically means to eat healthy and when I would take pictures and show them what the food was that we were being served they were kind of working with me to try to eat as healthy as possible around it um, so even though they started having healthy items at the shelter we cannot control what we are served so sometimes we are still served a soy chickenless chicken patty 10 meals out of a 14 meal period. It's the same thing because different cooks won't know what the other cooks served for the vegetarians. So um, there's no variety, there's no fresh vegetables, there's no fresh fruit. Sometimes the fresh fruit will run out after 20 minutes. So if you're having the rest of the, if you come down to lunch at 1230, the fruit's already gone. So you're just told that you're, you don't get any fruit. Um, and, um, at this current shelter, we don't have access to any refrigeration. We can't um, store food. We can't, um, if we have, even if we go to a work, we cannot get a bagged lunch. We were told that they don't have to do bagged lunches. They can do save a plate for dinner, but then you have to risk if um, anybody else takes the plate. Um, that's happened both times. 
um, or um, one time I was told that they were going to save or they were going to prepare lunches for me for when I was working on election day and that never happened. So I ended up having to spend about $26 for the equivalent of three meals at Dwayne Reed because Dwayne Reed was the only thing open at 4 a.m. on my way to work. Um, and then just funny recent things from this past week was for breakfast we had French toast one day. The French toast was served cold. Um, uh, the shelter staff this morning were discussing if they might be able to borrow the refrigerator in the kitchen because their own refrigerator was broke. And then we've seen shelter staff be able to um, eat the food that we're having and get access to milk and stuff they needed for their coffee. So that's the food that we're seeing that is there for us that we're seeing staff be able to access. Thank you so much for your testimony. Mm -hmm. um, and do you want to, yes, if there are. <coughs> so make sure the red light is on. And we were also joined by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, and earlier we were joined by Councilmember Reynoso as well. And Traeger. Hi, my name is Cece. Glad to be here this morning or this afternoon. But anyway, the full complaint is that the milk is going bad or is sour before the expiration day, and they serve it to us. Also, overcooked and undercooked food such as vegetables and pastas and other stuff, molten bread that been served to the clients. Mice was been seen in the kitchen area, roll, rolling, you know, running around. And there are days when they do not have enough food to serve the clients, so they give them lunch for dinner time. <clears throat> uh, so the one is. Also is they don't have enough supplies, let's say, cups, silverware, something like that. Um, like there are times when I want to eat my cold cereal, I will have to use a fork because they, they did not order enough supplies. Um, also, let's do this fast. Okay, there have been clients who have medical problem and they brought it into the staff member attention of what they can and cannot have, the staff ignore the doctor notes. And sometimes the, some of these clients don't have any money and they will use some of their money to buy nutritious stuff because they cannot eat this stuff. And another thing is um, also um, according to what I was told that the director has control on what food she orders. So that's, that's all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Um, Council Member Gurdenchik has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, I, along with um, Chair Levin, uh, I'm probably the, the two strongest advocates for feeding people in the city of New York, but um, not just feeding them, but making sure that the food is uh, of a, a good quality, not just a decent quality. My only question then is for all of you or any of you is, have you ever gotten a good meal in a New York City shelter? Not one? One maybe? On the end? I, I, I feel like, what's the point? If, I mean, I, a lot of times I'm asking the people who are in the street. You have to speak into the mic, sorry. Okay. A lot of times I'm actually asking people in the stream, like, is there something I can, you know, if, like, if I have food that I can't eat, I might as well give it to them. And they're like, well, I don't, I don't like the food. I keep throwing up from food, so I'm not going to even try it. And that's why I left. I'm like, well, listen, I'm thinking the same thing. And I just, last night, I didn't, I didn't sleep there. I was just, I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't sleeping, you know. So, like, there are many times, it's like, what's the point? If you're in, in a bed and they're, they're getting paid for you to sleep in a bed, which I have a medical bed and they don't let me bring a medical bed, which is not the whole story, but you have a bed, and, and, you know, they're supposed to support you in, like, at least food, the basics, and laundry, and they're not doing a lot of times, there's a lot of corruption in that stuff, then what, what, are, you, what are you doing there? Like, what's the point? Thank I'd you. rather focus on school, let me sleep somewhere else, let me figure out food on my own, you know? Um, because you were asking if I've had at least one meal, then I can answer that because um, we had a chef briefly. Um, it's a complicated situation as to what happened to him. 
he felt so bad at what he was limited to serving us before they started doing the plant-based meals that he actually went out of his way to prepare um, salads for the vegetarians. So he actually would, and it made everyone want to pre you know, pretend to be a vegetarian for a day to get the fresh salad. But it was with the chopped up half a bell pepper. Um, it was like magnificent. You would not think you had gotten it at a city shelter, which made, again, everyone want to pretend to be a vegetarian for a day. I would say I've had a few lunches that were edible. Okay. Partly, just a sandwich. And when they volunteer from other organizations, um, when they bring food in, sometimes they will actually bring food to the sidewalk and then people from the shelter will run downstairs to get the food that they bring. But that's not food that's being dispensed by the shelter. Yeah, um, I had, um, before they transferred me from the, the other shelter to this shelter where I'm at now, the food was delicious. They served the food on site, they cooked there. I don't very rarely I eat breakfast, but I will eat lunch and dinner if I'm there. Very terrific. I wish I was back there. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, to this panel. Um, this is a very disturbing testimony that we've heard here today from you, so um, I thank you, and you can be sure that the council uh, has, we haven't heard the last of this. I'm sure Chair Levin will lead us forward as he always does. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Thank you so much to this panel. Thank you for coming in, taking your time um, to come into the city hall and testify at this hearing. Um, and Thank you for having us. Um, and, um, and thank you for being advocates on behalf of, of everybody else, and, um, and let's, let's keep working on it. So thank you. We have two more panels. Barbara Hughes, Project Renewal. Giselle Ruthier, Coalition for the Homeless. And Jacqueline Simone, Coalition for the Homeless. We are going to. Yeah, I got to run to the restroom.
Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I will, I'm gonna call up some additional folks and see if, if folks are still here. Be Deborah Berkman. And then we'll have one more panel after this. Okay, whoever wants to begin. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Giselle Ruthier. I'm the policy director at the Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, we've submitted joint testimony with Legal Aid, um, and I'll summarize it here today. I want to thank uh, Chair Levin for his leadership and advocacy on behalf of homeless New Yorkers, and I especially want to thank all of the individuals who testified before us, providing incredibly important personal experiences related to today's <coughs> hearing. More than 62,000 adults and children sleep in shelters each night. As of September 2019, single adults spend an average of 425 days in the shelter system. Families with children spend an average of 428 days in the shelter system, and adult families spend an average of 613 days in shelters. The length of time that individuals and families spend living in the shelter system underscores the need to provide appropriate, healthy, and appetizing meals to the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Food is a basic human necessity, and the quality of food in shelters does not appropriately meet the needs of the 62,000 New Yorkers who often have no other options for sustenance. Our firsthand observations and the information we collect from homeless New Yorkers highlight the inadequate oversight of food provision in shelters. Multiple state and city agencies with inspection authority have failed to ensure the food served in shelters is safe to consume and meets the needs of shelter residents. And one other quick thing I wanted to point out is um, that was alluded to in a lot of the questions today was that good food, it shouldn't just be about minimum standards. Good food equals dignity, it equals comfort, it equals care, and that's something that is so lacking in the shelter system overall. So at the Coalition for the Homeless, we operate 11 direct service programs uh, serving homeless families, adults, and children. We serve as the court-appointed monitor of the single adult shelter system and the city-appointed monitor of the family shelter system. And we maintain a regular presence in all shelters at all hours of the day and night. We also facilitate a weekly meeting of our client advisory group, which includes individuals with lived experience of homelessness. Through these multiple roles, we receive frequent and widespread complaints about food and shelters, including issues such as quality, preparation, handling, storage, accommodations, and nutritional content. I'm gonna read a few examples of reports that we, uh, we have sent to the Department of Homeless Services regarding food issues we've observed and complaints we've received from shelter residents. Poor food conditions span all shelters, but are particularly bad at single adult shelters, which more often than other types of shelters provide meals to residents through contracted vendors. So a few examples, a May 2019 visit to Casa de Carino, a women's shelter, resulted in this report to DHS. Quote, several clients expressed issues with the quality of the food. Several clients have reported having increased health issues since enter entering Casa de Carino. One client reported that her diabetes medication had been tripled by her doctors since moving to Casa de Carino in order to deal with the poor quality of the food that is served there. It was reported by more than one client that on several occasions meals were served by maintenance workers who do not have food handlers licenses, end quote. An April 2019 visit to Auburn Family Residence, an adult family shelter where several clients became ill in October when they were served spoiled chicken salad resulted in this report to DHS, quote, we received many complaints from clients about the quality of the food served in the cafeteria, common complaints related to burned or undercooked food and moldy bread and spoilage, end quote. Uh, a couple more things to wrap up. Uh, March 2019 visit to Broadway House uh, Women's Shelter resulted in this report to DHS, quote, the shelter has no vending machines and diabetic snacks are not available. Clients state that there's no alternative meal for those clients with allergies and other dietary restrictions. A client whose name we've redacted was in a diabetic coma for two weeks during 2018 because she could not access appropriate food. She spent a total of six weeks in the hospital, end quote. Uh, we have more, but I'll, I'll, I'll lead you to read those. Um, in addition to these reports, we've interviewed shelter residents regarding issues of food and combinations, portions, and quality. We've compiled a sample of their quotations in the attached document to our testimony, along with photographs of meals that they've been served in the shelter system. I would encourage you to take a look at those. We also have more that we're happy to share with you. Um, these photographs show meals that are unappetizing, spoiled, under overcooked, um, and lacking, appear to be lacking in appropriate nutritional content. In sum, we recommend DHS implements a complete overhaul of food provision, including assessing the quality of its contracted food vendors, conducting routine inspections, providing appropriate accommodations to individuals who have dietary restrictions due to medical conditions, religious observance, or other special needs. And we also recommend that the city and state agencies with oversight authority immediately implement routine inspections of food provision at shelters. These agencies include DHS, Department of Mental Health and Mental Hygiene, and the state's Department of Health and OTDA. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Jackie Simone. I'm a policy analyst at Coalition for the Homeless. I'm going to be reading testimony on behalf of Dustin Jones, a client with our client advisory group who felt very strongly about testifying but is at work today and is unable to attend in person. My name is Dustin Jones. I am a disability rights activist, age 31. In September 2017, I had the unfortunate pleasure of, serving, of living in the shelter system for 20 months. Now, although there's a long list of problems with accessible and improper training of staff and especially DHS police, I will keep my comments to food issues. With my time in shelter, most of it was spent at Clark Thomas Men's Shelter on Randall's Island. To my knowledge, it's a no-cook shelter and I believe the food was from vendors of some sort. The food was terrible and insufficient for children, yet alone grown men. We had the same thing on various days for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with almost no changes. For example, for at least Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, for breakfast we had one pack of coffee, a banana, one, one milk, and if we were lucky, some type of juice. You could not have seconds. I would skip breakfast most of the time because it wasn't worth waking up for. I used to spend my money a lot and buy food throughout the day, but that becomes very expensive, especially if you're supposed to be in a place providing you decent meals. Lunch would somehow get worse. I used to make a joke that Clark Thomas had an aquarium in the backyard because it seemed like every day they would have fish for lunch, very undercooked from what I noticed. On two occasions when I actually ate the fish because it looked the most cooked, I got food poisoning severely and was rushed to the emergency room via ambulance. Although I am allergic to shellfish, at one point I had to lie and tell them I'm allergic to all fish just so they would give me something else in return for the fish on the days they had it. Sometimes they had it for lunch and dinner. Lunch on Sundays was very unappetizing. Cold sandwiches, tuna wrapped up, or turkey and cheese, mayonnaise packs and mustard packs, one fruit, coleslaw or potato salad, milk, and that's it. I will admit dinner was better most of the time, but when they did have something decent, it felt like if you weren't in the first 30 to 40 people to eat, you were left with leftovers from God knows when. Some things were obviously expired and smelled horrible, but when you brought it up to the attention of staff, they would think the problem was us or if the really undeniably smelly stuff, they threw it away quickly before anyone made a scene. In a nutshell, the only time I ate decently in shelter that wasn't afforded with my own money is when the nuns came on Tuesday nights and fed us, if I got to them in time, and the two Thanksgivings, two Christmases, and one of the two New Years in 2017, 2018 that I spent there. One other problem, particularly at Clark Thomas, is those of us who had money or were lucky enough to work and buy our own food were strictly prohibited from bringing outside food into the building via DHS officers, and it wasn't fair because we were forced to eat the nothing they had there or go hungry altogether. They would make us toss it out, and for those who refused, they would arrest them on trumped up charges of disorderly conduct and even send some guys to the hospital and charge them as an emotionally disturbed person. In conclusion, I would like to see changes to the food service and the shelter system. Although I am not there anymore, based on the time I did spend there, I sympathize so much and care for the people who I have left behind. It is not fair to kick a man or a person when they are down on their luck, to make them throw away their food and settle for nothing, and the food that is provided isn't even enough to give the average five-year-old child. Being in the shelter system for me was mentally abusing on so many levels. I felt like I was in jail for 20 months and I never want to go back, but with the housing system in this city being so poor, God knows. But even if I never return, let's think about those people who are in there suffering from diabetes and other health complications who need a balanced diet to make their, take their medication or even just to survive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Chair Levin, council members and staff, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Deborah Berkman, and I'm a senior staff attorney in the Public Benefits Unit and Shelter Advocacy Initiative at the New York Legal Assistance Group, or NILAG. The Shelter Advocacy Initiative at NILAG provides legal services and advocacy to low-income people in the shelter system. Based on our experience working with individual adults and homeless families in the system, we appreciate the opportunity to offer the following comments on food access and quality. Our first concern is the sufficiency of the food available to shelter residents. And here I just want to respond to something that Dr. Lorac said, and it wasn't part of my, uh, my scripted testimony, but she had spoken about how SNAP is supposed to be used to make up for some of the deficiencies in the food that's being offered, but that's really, that's not a viable plan because there are many people in the shelter system that aren't eligible for SNAP. And even if they are eligible for SNAP, because SNAP is calculated using housing costs, people who are in shelter typically have low SNAP allotments, so that won't really work. 
Food insecurity has significant health and economic consequences, and our clients frequently report that they experience food insecurity, even when they're at shelters that offer meals, and this is because the meals they're served are too small. They say they're only allowed to have one serving of each item per meal, and that the serving sizes themselves are very small, and many of our clients report being perpetually hungry. Additionally, clients who are employed or have work assignments that they have to report to have difficulty accessing the food served by their shelters. This is due to the fact that shelter meals are served at specific times, and if the residents aren't present at those times, they cannot get a meal. Additionally, they cannot get a meal when they return to shelter after meal times, and they're not allowed to take their meals early. This is further complicated by the fact that recipients of cash public assistance are not awarded the restaurant allowance supplement if they reside in a shelter that actually does serve meals. And as such, job hours preclude residents from accessing food at their shelter, but their public assistance also leaves them without a means to purchase food. Working shelter residents should not be punished with hunger for being employed. The problem of DHS resident uh, shelter hunger is further amplified by shelter policies that prevent people from bringing in outside food to shelters. When residents miss meal and are prevented from bringing in and are storing outside food, they're left with no meal options. And this is particularly harmful for residents with health issues or disabilities that need to eat between meals for their well-being or to safely take medication. While residents can be granted a reasonable accommodation to allow them to eat between meals or at off times, that process can take months and requires the active cooperation of the resident's health care provider. And despite what Dr. Lurek said earlier, um, I've never had a client who has had a staff member of the shelter help them procure a, a reasonable accommodation, especially if they don't have a regular doctor. And many people just don't have access to medical care who are in the shelter. Not everybody is eligible for Medicaid and not everybody has health insurance. Another major concern for NIA clients who are shelter residents is the poor quality of the food provided in shelter. The meals are very high in sodium and they're most often prepackaged and they rarely encounter fresh fruits or vegetables. Um, also, clients with medical conditions and disabilities, um, the most common of which is diabetes, are not accommodated, and DHS takes the position that they're accommodated, but in reality, uh, almost no client has reported being accommodated. Um, in conclusion, they report, residents report the food is both of poor nutritional quality and inadequate, and if the goal of DHS is to protect and care for homeless New Yorkers as they seek permanent housing, then DHS must provide food service that matches these goals. Shelter residents deserve proper nour nourishment. We want to thank the Committee on General Welfare for the work it's done to facilitate shelter for vulnerable New Yorkers and for taking this opportunity to continue to improve the condition for shelter residents. Thank you. And I just want to uh, acknowledge the work that NILAG does around um, individuals with medical conditions, chronic medical conditions um, in the shelter system and the kind of endless re revolving door between the shelter system and our, our hospitals. And we just heard that on the previous panel that one of the individuals has, has had to go into um, the ER uh, numerous times. And, and, um, and uh, you mentioned before about um, uh, the individual in a diabetic coma. Um, you know, very, very concerning um, uh, the the health impact and the and the and the impact on, on a, as a public health issue um, that uh, nutrition that linkage between nutrition and public health in this instance. So thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Levin and fellow council members. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Barbara Hughes, and I am the executive director of City Beat Kitchens at Project Renewal, a New York City homeless services nonprofit agency. For more than 52 years, Project Renewal has empowered individuals and families who are homeless and at risk to renew their lives through comprehensive health homes and jobs. Project Renewal's hallmark workforce development program is our culinary arts training program, which receives critical funding from the city council, and we are great very, very grateful for that. Since 1995, the program has trained over 1,700 unemployed, homeless, and at-risk New Yorkers for careers in restaurants, corporate dining, and institutional catering. Our 85% job placement rate is above the national average for similar programs. And these are jobs with career ladders and starting wages above minimum wage. 
1997, we started City Beat Kitchens, a catering business to create even more jobs for our graduates and to feed New Yorkers in need. City Beat Kitchen serves over three million meals each year at DHS shelters, supportive housing, and senior centers across the city. The people we feed through City Beat Kitchens are also the people we serve through our shelter, housing, jobs, and health programs. And because we are committed to the overall welfare of New York City, sustainability and reducing food waste are priorities, in addition to providing nutritious and delicious meals to everyone. By employing formerly homeless and criminal justice involved individuals, we are helping to reduce shelter, jail, Medicaid, and public assistance. We estimate that City Bee Kitchens saves the city $1.2 million annually through those reductions. City Bee Kitchens has been a proven path out of poverty for thousands of homeless New Yorkers. That is our public purpose. As a result of our emphasis on sustainable employment and working with a vulnerable population, City Bee Kitchens is being priced out of the market by private vendors, and today our mission and work is at risk. In recent months, we have lost two of our biggest customers. Both are homeless services organizations uh, to competitors who are undercutting our pricing. Now, dozens of jobs are at risk. The stability individuals have created for themselves as a result of a steady good job is at risk, and the quality of food our city provides to homeless New Yorkers, an issue that has been in the headlines lately, is at risk. We are here to request the Council's support and assistance to preserve City Beat Kitchens. Thanks for allowing me to testify today. Thank you very much. And uh, the um the culinary program at uh, Project Renewal is something that the council has supported um, and will continue to support for, I imagine, like, uh, many years. And so um, we see the great value in the work that you have been doing and, um, and can only um, imagine that the um, understanding of your staff for um, what others are going through, what the, what the recipients of the food are going through um, uh, is evident in, in the way that they prepare the food and, and, uh, and, the, and the, the quality of food that they're providing. So. Because they have gone through it themselves. Yeah. And the training program is our mission, the social purpose enterprise, the catering company drives the mission. And, and um, how many how many um, former uh, residents of shelter have have come through uh, uh, both Project Renewal's overall culinary program and, and City Beats Kitchen? Uh, 1,700 have graduated to date. Um, the the social purpose enterprise City Beat Kitchens employs about 60 people and. Two thirds of those are former, our students and graduates of the program, and many are are um, explained here had have been formerly homeless, have been in the shelter system, may still live in the shelter system, and they're salaried or paid hourly and have health benefits and yeah, full benefits, yes, full benefits, full time employees, full time employees, um, retirement benefits. Yes, we have them. They're not the best they could be, but we have them, okay. yes. Um, so we'll, we'll look forward to continuing to speak and, and, um, and uh, engaging on, on how we um, reorient the, the, this entire system to be more holistic. So we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for your testimony. And uh, there's a lot of work to do here, so let's, let's keep on working. Next panel, Roxana Henry, Urban Justice Center. Felix, Felix Guzman, I believe, Coalition. And Elohim Ray from People Rights.
Thank you, Chair uh, Levin and members of the General Welfare Committee for the opportunity to testify before you. My name is Roxana Henry, and I'm a social worker and advocate for the Urban Justice Center Safety Net Project. We are extremely appreciative of the General Welfare Committee, that the General Welfare Committee is holding a hearing on the longstanding issues faced with shelter residents in relation to the food shelters. For years, clients have discussed with us the problem they experience with food and in the shelters, and we've heard their frustration and their complaint to homeless services staff more often go unattended to. We submit a longer written testimony that discuss our concern in details, but for the purpose of speaking with you today, I will focus on highlights and recommendations. It's important to note that this hearing is happening following reports of food poisoning from food served in Ar Arborn Shelter in Brooklyn. Arborn is well known by service providers and many homeless folks as a punishing place with a long history of institutional violence, which has included utterly harmful building conditions and transgressive and abusive behavior by some staff members. <clears throat> the most recent issue with the food are part of a much longer history of serious problem at the shelter that have continued. This include years of complaint about spoiled and rotten food served to the residents as we've heard previously. In our, written, in our written testimony, let me clear my throat, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we provide many examples of people's personal experience with food that makes them ill and is generally unhealthy. For example, there are some individuals who we work with while other examples are from the state fair hearings where shelter residents have thought to obtain a, a resident, uh, restaurant allowance or recovery of SNAP benefits due to, due to spoiled food as a result of preventive issues on the shelter level. One example from a st state fair hearing shows the kind of difficulty faced by shelter residents who have refrigerator access to store food. I'll read the state decisions, decision. At the hearing, the appellant testified that the refrigerator stopped working, and on about July 18, she reported this problem to the shelter administration. On July 20th, she was provided with another refrigerator. She testified the replacement refrigerator did not work, plus it was infected with roaches. She stated that with the assistance of one of the shelter maintenance staff, she eventually, about two weeks later, was provided with a working refrigerator. The appellant testimony is credible in that it was persuasive, consistent, and detailed. She also showed a video of her cell phone uh, of the refrigerator with at least six roaches walking inside of it. Our experience with this kind of example happens across the shelter system and they are preventable. I'll say that again, they are preventable. We also know that city council and municipal agencies have invested significant resources in improving healthy food access for school aged children. Unfortunately, we have not seen the efforts on remotely the same level to address food insecurity among New Yorkers living in shelter. We recommend the city give the same attention to the provision of nutritious, nutritious meals in the shelter. Our recommendations are as follow. Increase the frequency of food inspection and ensure that all inspections are unannounced, as previously uh, stated. Have an outside agency conduct and review biannually food client food satisfaction surveys. Publicly post the results of food inspection from DHS, DOM, DOHMH, and OTADA listed by shelter. We need full transparency. Create a hotline and online form in which residents can be part of the complaint, can anonymously complain regarding food shelter, in addition to tracking all food complaints. And ensure a streamlined process for individuals and family and public assistance residing in shelter that do not serve meal and do not provide working kitchen or for those who cannot eat shelter meal due to medical, religious, and other dietary reasons to be budgeted for restaurant allowance grant. And I want to add one more thing, as uh, we mentioned CUNY earlier with one of our clients from Urban Justice Center, was that the idea of EBT in the cafeteria is a very good idea, and we should try to really bring that to the CUNY schools, as well as the need assessment that CUNY has been doing for the last two years. It's time that they complete it and actually show us what they found. And again, I do want to say full transparency is needed, and we want to have folks with firsthand experience at the table making sure that the policies are being implemented correctly. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everyone. I want to say thank you to the committee and thank you to all in attendance who are doing the work to actually build better, better healthier communities. Uh, with that said, um, I'm going to talk about something. I am formerly incarcerated. If formerly you identify yourself. Oh, sorry. Felix Guzman. I'm with College for the Homeless. Uh, I identify as formerly homeless and formerly incarcerated for a reason. There's a reason why. Uh, I'm a former regular resident of a cluster site, and I be then I became homeless as a result of that. Now, um, I bring up incarceration because the food, at least there, although unedible, is high in cal calories, and you can actually at least gain weight. Now, the issue with uh, people in shelter is that, um, obviously, there's not enough food, and the food that's given isn't, uh, isn't um, to the standard of actually being able to be healthy enough to transition out of shelter. Again, uh, there's a reason why some people are in shelter, and food might be uh, a root cause of that if you cannot actually be healthy enough to move forward in doing what you have to do, whether it be employment, uh, taking care of being in program and whatnot. Now, um, I wanted to actually touch on a couple of things. Um, obviously, the access to quality uh, food, uh, again, caloric intake, uh, is, it's, it's, it's set the basis of human life. Like, you know, the basic needs are food, shelter, and um, food, shelter, and safety. Now, if we are not able to actually have a healthy meal, then how are we supposed to actually navigate the trauma of homelessness? The shelter industrial complex <laughs> is, is, people are making hundreds of millions, billions of dollars to provide substandard care, substandard food, substandard housing, substandard everything. Now, at the very least, we could be provided a meal that actually can compensate us for the trauma that we're enduring. Now, I want to actually talk about, um, again, let me touch on that point. I, I wrote something here for that. There's a reason why Coalition for the Homeless actually inspects the food, uh, food, um, food and the food placement and where, where the food is actually being held. That, that is sad that the city has to actually have an outside watchdog do this. The fact that Auburn is a city shelter and that the city itself is responsible for poisoning its own residents is insane. That's insane. Now, making, and this goes to talk about the vendors that are actually making money off the city, providing these meals. Making money off of providing less than basic necessities to a shelter resident who the city is paying itself, duplex apartment prices in some cases is self-cannibalization. Why are we incentivizing providing contracts to vendors who provide substandard meals? That is, that, that just doesn't make sense to me. Like, I, I just have an associate's degree, but like, it's just common sense. You know, and uh, New York City being at the forefront of that shelter industrial complex, be because we have a right to shelter mandate, we at the very least should be offering some dignity to those that are disadvantaged, that are in shelter. We have children, we have the elderly, we have the disabled, we also have victims of domestic violence who are further being victimized by not having actually the su sufficient enough meals to actually power through what they're going through to actually heal. Now, um, again, like I might have gone all over the world with this, but um, it's just common sense that we take take um, take care to, to take care of the disadvantage. Again, like there's a reason why people don't transition out of shelter. There's a reason for that that some people spend years and whatnot, and it's the failures of the system itself. At the very root of it, food, 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 food in a safe place to actually sleep. Like uh, it's it's crazy that for me, I have to actually find a program that actually has meals on site because the food and the shelters are not that good. Why am I going to a nonprofit to take, to, ca to take care of my basic needs? Again, and how would I qualify for that? Being formerly incarcerated. So at the very least, make things accessible, make things healthy, and just, uh, you know, like, hold the shelter system and these vendors accountable for providing less than substand, less than substandard, not substandard, but less than substandard. The grade of food in shelter at some places is actually one grade above the prison food and two, sh two grades above street homeless food, which is eating out of the garbage. Thank you. So I just want to thank you, and I appreciate you going around the world with it, because yeah. the reality, and I think, I think you get to this in your testimony, is that it seems as if we um, would rather, as a city, or at least that's the policy, mm. spend a little less money or try to save a few pennies than provide decent level of service. Mm -hmm. And so 
every time you look at why things are not working properly within the shelter system mm -hmm. or within the DHS system, you can always point back to, well, they don't want to spend the money to make it work properly. Mm -hmm. And it always comes back to that, that there's always this um, desire to save a couple of bucks mm -hmm. and therefore we can't provide decent food. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we can't provide adequate vouchers. Therefore, we can't provide enough affordable housing. Therefore, it's always about, well, we don't want to spend the money. And, that's, and, and, and so I think you get to the root of it, which is that we know we can mm -hmm. provide better than substandard housing, better than substandard nutrition, better than substandard services. Mm -hmm. We just know that it, it's within our grasp. We just have to prioritize it as a city. I think that I think New Yorkers would are would get behind that. Mm -hmm. I really do. Thank you. Uh, I just want to um, jump on this. Um, that some of it's not about money, though. It's about management. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, for instance, somebody's trying to bring in food because they don't get the quality food mm -hmm. in the shelter. They try to bring it in and they, they get it taken away yeah. and thrown away. That's not about money. That's about mismanagement. It's about being inhumane. It's about an attitude that we're seeing. And this is a very um, distressful hearing because of what we're hearing. What we heard from the administration is totally different from what we're hearing from the uh, advocates and, and, and shelter inhabitants. It is a disgrace. And, and I appreciate your testimony. Every, everyone's here. Uh, but I want to ask a question, and then we're going to hear from you. But I want to ask a question. Is, has it gotten worse, complaints about food? And, and uh, you know, anybody can jump in. But has it, have, have the complaints gotten much worse? Or are we getting, are we getting a little better? Uh, as a formerly homeless person, uh, <laughs> I ate most of my meals uh, elsewhere, and uh, as, a, as a member of the Coalition for the Homeless uh, Client Advisory Group, I hear the frustration in people with restricted diets and also with uh, needs that supersede what caloric, intake, caloric calories are being offered in the meals. So at the very root of it, like, however long these contracts have been in place, that's however long it's been, been bad. So uh, again, like, the food, I'm sure, hasn't changed much since, with, since it was provided as that is just the nature of like how things work with uh, these vendors. And I think that it has only gotten better because of agencies like College for the Homeless that inspect the food and also just the media attention that's blitzing because of the, uh, the unfortunate controversy but actual lived truth of those that are uh, that were unfortunately poisoned. That, I'm saying poisoned. Not. I'm not saying that the food was uh, unedible. I'm saying poisoned, because this was actually preventable, and um, it's still not palatable. That truth uh, being lived out for me. So uh, for me, the food is as it was, and it's just as it was, and as it is, it wasn't edible for me. I, I'd go elsewhere. Thank you. And I'd like to add something. As a person who was, um, received public assistance <clears throat> and I was a student uh, within CUNY and worked for a non-for-profit before I came to Urban Justice Center within CUNY, I can say it's gotten worse because there's been such a big increase of homelessness and such a big increase of food insecurity and where we uh, at one point saw maybe a few people coming in with those kind of issues. We're seeing loads of people coming in now <clears throat> seeking housing, seeking all kinds of um, assistance that they're not able to connect to. So it's gotten worse, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. I'm Elohim Day, for the record, and I'd like to say rest in peace, Elijah Cummins. Um, it's a lot that I need to say but I don't have a lot of time. I don't even know where to begin, but I'm gonna start here. Um, I've been homeless for five years. Uh, I slept on the streets. I slept uh, in my friend's van. I slept in a laundry mat, laundry room. Um, 
how I got in this place because of management, the officer of the court, which is the attorney, and the magistrate, which is the judge. And they was all in cahoots with each other, extorting and rocking to her or for people who don't know law. That's why I'm here. Um, within three years, I've been to different shelters. Over the last five years, I've been in different shelters. And not saying all shelters are bad, some are good, but some are micromanaged, meaning that you have people that's dependent, then you got people that's independent, right? The people that's dependent, they depend on the system. They need help, they take medication. Then you got people that's independent that don't take medication at all. So what they do is they put people that's sick, mentally sick, and put people who are mentally uh, are functioning properly together in a room with people that don't smoke, with non-smokers, they put people with they put people in the room with smokers who are non-smokers, and that could affect people's health. And that's a matter of concern for me because I have bronchitis. So in my case, you got people that smoke reefer, you got people that smoke K2. And in a shelter system, it's supposed to be, that's supposed to be against the policy. You know, there's supposed to be no drugs or no, no uh, smoking in, in, in inside the shelter system, but yet they go against that. And it's hard for me and it's hard for other people that's there. Now, I caught a foot fungus being in the shelter. I got that on record. And I explained that to my caseworker and I explained it to whoever's in charge. And they ain't do anything about that. People have feces in the shelter system. There's people that, there's people that's in the shelter that get paid to do nothing. They don't do their job properly. They don't clean the, the showers properly. It's flies in the shower and everything. People taking a dump in the, sh in, in, in the shower. That's how I caught a foot affection. Um, I lost weight because I'm stressed. Um, I, I was 180 at one point. Then it went to 140, then it went to 120. Now I'm back at 144. I, Got a letter from the doctor saying that I'm supposed to receive double portion meals. The shelter that I'm in now, they're not, they're not giving me double portion meals. And um, they just stopped, they, they stopped giving double portion meals altogether. They, they stopped giving seconds. So now only people that could actually eat are those who come home from work, right? And so the people that's not working who have a mental disability or whatever, which is me, I have a disability, I was labeled schizophrenic, bipolar, what they say, but I have a learning disability. And a lot of people took advantage of me because of that. And so I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of other people that's not here, who would love to be here to speak. When you have people that come and do investigations in the shelter, y'all go to the, the people that's in authority, like the director, or supervisor. They're not giving you who they truly are. Behind closed doors, they're a totally different person. They put on this mask in front of y'all so that they can keep y'all at bay from putting the pressure on them. There's, there's people that have, the shelter have a lot of, a lot of violations, right? Uh, you could walk in the shelter and say, well, the, the kitchen is in violation, such and such is in violation. If y'all have like undercovers to come into the shelter system to see how things really operate, it'll blow y'all mind. Some of y'all would never experience this experience because y'all never been there. Y'all just come and have conversations with people, but y'all never actually lived in the shelter system where you see the staff get nasty with people. So when y'all come in, they want to be a profession. That's 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 a violation of interest, you know. And, and it's a violation of interest. And 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 the uh, my my the longer you stay in the shelter system, 
you're going to, it's going to be inevitable that you're going to have problems. You're going to fight because you're, going, you're not going to get along with somebody who you don't know. You don't know these guys. They're strangers, totally strangers to you. And they come in with their own issue. You could be walking to get something to eat online and somebody bump you. Excuse me, sir, why you bump me? Hey, yo, do I know you? What's up? What you going to do? You're going to get into a fight. And when you get into a fight, DHS officers going to lock you up. They don't care about who's right or who's wrong. They don't care about that. How I know? It happened to me. I didn't get arrested. They gave me a summons. I was in an altercation with a guy who kept harassing me. I explained it to the, the staff. This was what's going on. And they totally ignored what I was saying. So we got into an altercation. Now, as we got into this altercation, the DHS officer was trying to break it up, but the guy was sneaking in punches. So I wasn't going to let him go so he could keep hitting me. So he came out, he used his baton and started hitting me using excessive force. I don't think that's right, you know what I'm saying, for a DHS officer to use excessive force when, uh, to break up a fight. It wasn't only one DHS officer, it was another one. It was two. One was using a walkie-talkie, and I got a witness to that, to attest to that. I got everything documented in my phone. So what I'm saying now is that there has to be a better way of handling things. The, the, um, the, the housing specialists, they're not doing their job properly. I have two vouchers. I got a 2010E, and I got a New York City FET. Uh, voucher. Again, I'm in a micro shelter, and it's 200 men there. And my caseworker saying she don't have time to, to help me look for a place because she got to manage other cases. The housing specialist did, saying she can't manage me because she, she got other things on her plate. I asked to speak to the director, and I never spoke to the director of the shelter. They, they like, She's avoiding me. And the longer I'm in there, the more problem complicated it becomes. I'm not there because I want to be there. I want to get out, but they keep me they keeping me there. It's like the longer they keep you, the more they're making money. You know, and the more they're making money, they're not worried about the people concern. They worried about their own concern, but then they treat people foul. And and that's a total injustice because 1982, the first shelter that was born, uh, the, the, the first shelter that was birthed to help the homeless, they had a system that was developed, you know what I'm saying? Now, we in a system now where it's broken yeah. and it's falling. And I'm not saying nothing new that nobody else said. Everybody been complaining when they've been going to the rallies for 20, 30 yeah. years. Why are we still in the same condition? But we gotta still talk about the same thing. I agree with you about the about the city FEPs in particular. Um, it's something that we're focused on a lot um, because the voucher amounts are nowhere near what it takes to get an apartment. Um, and the 2010E, I mean, we just you know we're, we need uh, every member of the city council to be to say yes to supportive housing developments in their in their districts, and and the, we need you know we need to make sure that those are. That, that, that those are getting built because the waiting list is too long, um, but um, but particularly with with city FAPs, I mean, there's something there's a lot that can be done there um, if we if we um, if we actually commit to doing it. But unfortunately, we got to wrap up in a minute. But I'll, uh, this, this, I'll this, let you wrap up. Yeah, it's um, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, with this 1020E, they talking about you have to have a birth certificate. I don't have one. I don't own one. And I have everything that I need to get out of the shelter, but they still keeping me there. That's, that's a problem for me. Like, why are you keeping me here when you know you can do something, but you're not doing it? I think for the people that have seniority in the shelter system who've been there for over 10 years plus or five years plus, they know they could be doing more, but they not. I think they all need to get fired and hire new people that will cater to the clients or, yeah, cater to the client's needs.
And if you don't mind me asking, feel free to, to not answer this, but uh, where are you right now? Which, which shelter? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that, Mr. Chairman. I'm on a uh, Fort Hamilton uh, shelter. Okay. That's uh, 651 West 168th Street. Okay. And who, who runs it? The city? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, we'll find out. Yeah. We'll find out. And, and, um, and we'll, we, we'll be in touch because we, we will make sure that we're, if, if there's any assistance we can provide in, um, in, in finding permanent housing, we'll be glad to do that. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. That's all I ask. And not just me, but, but for, for people that need it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, now, for those who can't help themselves, they need extra help, and they could get the extra help that they need. And thank you for, for being here to advocate on behalf of everybody. And we really appreciate your testimony. It was very, very insightful and very helpful. So I want to, I want to tell you I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sorry. So I just have one question um, for the members of the committee is, what happens next, right? You know, as advocates, as clients, where, wh what's the next step that we are gonna make to make this a solution that's real and concrete and that we leave here knowing that we're moving forward? So in, in my experience, uh, I've been on the committee for 10 years, been chairing it for six, that um, the, the way to make change is to um, organize, and focus on what we want to see happen, um, and then and then call attention to it, and um, be there to do the, the 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 rallies and the just to just to create um, a movement around around issues. I think that that in my experience that that's been the most successful, and I've um, and it's not a hundred percent guarantee, but calling attention to an issue impacts how it's uh, discussed at the budget level and it's, it, it, it gets out there in the press and it gets out there so that the mayor hears it and the commissioner hears it and I think that that is, you know, if, if, when it's coming from the right place and, I, and this, this is coming from the right place, like it can be really, really impactful. Um, it might take some time, it can be kind of annoying, um, but it is, it's, it's the thing that I've seen work in the, in the time that I've been here. And, and just one, one other uh, comment by Councilmember Grudenchik. I want to thank you all for being here today. And I want to thank you for your question. And I think the chairman is absolutely right. Um, it does take a lot of people all rowing, so to speak, in the same direction um, to make change. I um, have been, frankly, uh, appalled by much of what I've heard today. Um, I want to associate myself also with uh, Councilman Holden's remarks, and it's it's not always about the amount of money that we're spending, but um, where we're spending it and how it's being spent and accountability and um, the city spending a great deal of money uh, on uh, providing for people who are without homes, but I'm not so sure that uh, based upon the testimony today, I continue not to be sure that we're getting our money's worth and you're certainly not getting your money's worth. And when it comes to uh, what we've heard today, especially about food and uh, the issue surrounding food, it is uh, painfully obvious from the testimony that we've heard today um, that we need a substantial upgrade um, in the quality of the food. Um, you know, there's an old saying, we are what we eat. And uh, I do understand about food intolerances. My son uh, suffered from them uh, to a great deal. He's better now, fortunately. Um, but uh, we are not getting our money's worth when it comes to food. And I, I've also shared with the chairman privately and I'll say this, and I've said it publicly today, um, we're spending less than 2.5% of a homeless service budget, according to the testimony we heard today, on food. I would dare say that there, there is almost no New Yorker um, who can survive uh, on 2.5% budget for food. Um, people of means, maybe because they have so much money, you can only eat so much, but the average New Yorker is spending far more um, than 2.5% of their budget on food. So thank you all for being here today, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I really believe, um, and I'll, I'll uh, express publicly what I've said to you privately, that uh, this committee and this council is going to have to take a much deeper dive, especially uh, during the upcoming budget process when we hear uh, from the Commissioner of, uh, of Social Services, Mr. Banks, and the DHS Commissioner um, about uh, how we're going to improve this situation. Thank you.
Thank you. And one other thing I just want to add to, in, answering, in answer to your question. Um, so uh, one example I can cite of, of getting something done, um, uh, Council Member Grudenchik um, came to the council, what year, Barry? Four years ago. Four years ago. And um, uh, immediately honed in on, on the EFAP budget, which is the, the emergency food budget out of HRA. And um, you know, he didn't really talk about anything else for the next couple of years. Every time I'd see him, he would talk about everybody. He became, he became like the EFAP guy. Um, and uh, whoever he was talking to, if it was anyone on our side, anyone on the mayor's side, mm -hmm. it was just that was like his, his thing. And, um, and it got a lot of attention on the issue. And it just takes, it was just that doggedness and that kind of, um, Sing, you know, kind of really real focus and passion that, that can get stuff done. And so that's a good example of, of <laughs> gotta be, gotta be uh, dogged on it, yeah. All right. So, um, so I wanna thank you again, and thank you for taking the time to be here. And, um, and again, the, the, um, the kind of clarity of purpose and passion and insight that you provided with your testimony has, has been uh, greatly appreciated by this committee. And it's all on the record, and it will be informing our policy for sure. Thank you. We look forward to continuing to work with you. And make sure on, uh, that we, we're, we're uh, uh, in contact on, on, uh, on everything. So okay. thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone, does anyone else wish to testify? Okay. Here at uh, 1.34 p.m., this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>